Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's Friday afternoon. We're in for a, a fantastic treat today. I think we have, we're going to, uh, originally we're going to five, now we're going to six. You're supposed to be happy about that. <laughs> six is better than five. You have more time with all these great people. Uh, uh, well, I have to be careful. Um, I uh, should first, I, because I introduce other people, no one introduces me and I always forget to introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Michael Speaks. I'm Dean of the School of Architecture here. Um, uh, we do have an incredible afternoon and I'm glad you all came. I'm very lucky I'm here. I'm literally barely here. I got here just in time. I wouldn't have missed this though. Um, I want to make a few opening comments and then uh, Linda is going to take over after that and uh, talk about the afternoon and how it's structured um, and she will get right into it. I'm going to just uh, uh, I say this often, but it's always true. I do write beautifully, so I'd rather just read something that I've written uh, than to say it. Uh, yep. So, um, so uh, in spring 2015, uh, School of Architecture announced the creation of the Harry Bergosian Endowed uh, Fellowship Program. The fellowship is meant to give faculty members early in their career the opportunity to spend a year developing a body of design research based on an area of interest where teach, uh, while teaching at the School of Architecture. The gift, the largest in the school's history by a living donor, was made by Paul de Bergosian, a 1964 graduate of the School of Education here at Syracuse, to honor her brother, Harry Bergosian, uh, who was a 1954 graduate uh, of the School of Architecture. Um, we, you, what you don't know is that we have a house full of Bergosians today uh, because all three of the Bergosian fellows are, are here today. Um, uh, so Maya Alam, who is sitting right here, was the inaugural fellow and did a great program very much like this, almost the same time of day, almost the same week, almost the same day last year uh, and it was a Maya had a terrific year and we were so excited and thrilled to have her as the as the first fellow she set a very high bar for us um, our current so Maya was the 2016 2017 Bergosian fellow um, our current 2017 2018 fellow is Linda Jung as all of you probably know and the symposium this afternoon is but one of the many contributions she's made uh, to the School of Architecture this year on May 3rd, we will open an exhibition of the work she and her students have produced uh, during this entire year. Um, I'm also very pleased to say, and I don't think many of you know this unless you follow me on social media, um, uh, which is not likely, uh, and, um, but I'm very pleased to say that the most recently selected Burgosian Fellow, uh, the 2018-2019, is he's here today. D do you guys know that? Everybody already knows it, so um, he's, uh, where is he? Oh, I don't have my glasses. I can't see him. James. Oh, James. Uh, James Long. He's right here. James, could you, would you stand up just so we know who you are? <laughs> James is the, so he'll be the fellow for next year. Uh, you'll learn more. We'll have a press release and you'll learn more about that. He's also just uh, th recently the winner of the Vilcek Prize which, uh, given the world that we live in today, is even more powerful and important. The Vilcek Foundation raises awareness of immigrant contributions in America and fosters appreciation of the arts and sciences. We could do with a lot more of that, I'd say. Um, so, uh, very happy that James will be here with us next year. And finally, uh, for our current uh, 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 Bergosian fellow, Linda Jung, just a brief bio um, I, can, I don't really need to read this, but I'm going to. Um, Linda did a, a B-Arc at, uh, at McGill University. She did an M-Arc at, uh, at the GSD at Harvard. Um, she's worked at many, many cool places, including the uh, Studio Oliver Eliasson, uh, Studio Other Spaces in Berlin, uh, Barkai Leibinger, um, uh, Christian Carrots, uh, WOJR Boston, and Approach Architecture Studio in Beijing. Her work has been published and exhibited internationally in Germany, Canada, the United States, Italy, Spain, and Japan. She was a Dean's Merit Scholar at uh, Harvard's GSD, where she received uh, MARC 1 AP with distinction, the AIA Henry Adams Certificate, and the James Templeton Kelly Thesis Prize. She received a BS uh, with first class honors from McGill. Um, she was also the recipient of the 75th Anniversary Scholarship at McGill, 
and on and on and, and, and on and on and on. I'm not going to read any more of that. Um, you, know, you all know she's great. She's fantastic. So uh, without saying much more, I just want to welcome all the guests. Uh, Linda will do all of the work from here on in. I'm very happy that I can just sit now and enjoy the rest of the day. I want to welcome all of you, though. Uh, very happy you're here at the school. Um, and welcome our resident uh, fellow and uh, theologian and philosopher who got his hands dirty this semester already. Very happy. Um, so anyway, welcome everybody. We're going to start now. Thank you all. Give, every, give all these people a very warm Syracuse welcome. So thank you for the lovely introduction and thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm really excited to share this amazing lineup with you. Um, I am so thrilled to finally get them all in a room. Uh, we've been corresponding via email and shared Dropbox and readings and articles um, for about six months now. So it's really nice to get everyone together and I'm really excited to share that conversation with all of you. Um, I just want to begin with a couple um, words of thanks. Um, those of you in the back, feel free to come in and, and sit down. down here. There's, there's space. Um, don't, yeah, don't be shy. Um, I want to begin by saying thank you to Dean Speaks and Associate Dean Zerniak, both for the support and also the incredible opportunity um, to not only be here on this fellowship, but to be able to organize uh, such, a, such a symposium um, and to bring this diverse group of people and voices um, into part of not just here today, but also to be part of the, um, the school and the fellowship uh, research. Um, I would also uh, uh, like to point out that the symposium is part of the Bogosian Fellowship, which was established through a generous donation from Paula de Bogosian uh, for her late brother, Harry. Um, so I'd also really love to thank Paula, who's just one of the most amazing human beings I've had the pleasure of meeting. Um, she just brings a smile to your face. Um, and uh, I also want to thank our incredible panelists for their energy, dedication, and time, as I'm sure I've taken up way too much of their time over the last uh, several months. Um, I'm very glad you guys could all be here and that no one's flights got canceled for the Nor'eastern that we just had. Um, and then I would also like to thank the amazing uh, group of staff here um, with whom, without whom the symposium would not have come together. Um, and a uh, special thank you to Maya Alam, um, who was the 2016-2017 Bakosian Fellow uh, for not only leaving me very big shoes to fill, um, but also being uh, an amazing uh, source of support and guidance uh, throughout this, my whole time here. Um, and then I would also like to thank um, the amazing community at Syracuse University, um, which includes both architecture school, the students and staff here, um, but the, this fellowship has also been um, collaborative across different um, schools in the university. Um, so I would really like to give and extend a, a really big thanks and gratitude um, towards uh, the ceramic department um, and especially Errol Willett, um, who has been, um, who's an associate professor of ceramics, um, who has been, I don't know if he's here right now, um, but he, who has been an amazing um, support and uh, the reason we're able to do all of this material research um, this semester. And I would also uh, really like to thank all of the um, faculty and staff over in the Comrade Building for putting up with um, us in that space as we occupy a lot of it, especially right now. Um, and of course, um, we've also been working with the Department of Religion uh, with Vika Mandela Gray, um, who is one of the speakers here today. Um, and then last but not least, I would really like to thank uh, the amazing students that I've had um, over the course of two semesters who've not only um, continuously surprised me with their work, um, but are just outstanding um, people and also very talented designers and future architects. Um, so I'd just like to start by contextualizing uh, the Beta Real Symposium um, as part of a series of events that will happen over the course of 2017, 2018, um, including Three courses, uh, several workshops taught by uh, symposium speakers, uh, the symposium, a gallery talk by Kay Michael Hayes, uh, and an exhibition. Um, and 
the focus of the broader uh, fellowship research um, explores making as a method for critical thinking, uh, and specifically the process of casting and mold making. So the constraints of iterative casting um, and the material behavior of ceramics push back on conventional, no conventional notions of preservation and construction, offering new ways of reading sites of memory, as well as new modes of intervening with history in the built environment. Produced over two semesters in two elective seminars and a VC studio, the body of work employs the inherent properties of iterative slip casting process as a mode of understanding and imagining sites that continue to remain difficult to fully grasp or comprehend. The contested space of the road, commemorative infrastructures, and the enigmatic practice of ritual. These three case study sites, each one more intangible and complex than the last, increasingly caught between conflicting ideologies, have become the testing grounds to explore how memory and identity politics can shape architecture in place, and how this can be critically thought through material and process. The slip casting process fo forces us to confront the dyna dynamic, ambivalent, and often contested ways which things are intertwined across time through negation, repetition, and transference. From original object to cast object, two molds are necessary. A negative plaster mold is used to cast the ceramic positive, and a double negative mold is used to cast the plaster mold. Um, in our explorations, an original object is always used as the double negative, which is almost, but not quite, a positive. As such, the original object is either destroyed during the casting process or used as a virtual um, 3D scan translated into CNC milled foam. Uh, the process described here makes palpable and therefore thinkable several entry points for grappling with questions of remembrance and forgetting in the built environment. The relay produced between the mold positive, negative, and the double negative can be thought of like the infinite relay which is produced between two mirrors facing one another. Although not a physical entity, the notion of infinity is rendered visible through the relay and is nonetheless just as real as the physical entity. This relay speaks towards the ways in which the intangible can be produced through the material world. Rather than the cast itself, the work force focuses on the potential of the cast to produce relays of intangibles, offering a way to explore the power of trace to invoke what is absent, absent as well as the way that everything leaves a mark. In the wake of making, something is always, always left behind. This relay is also produced through the iterative nature of slip casting as an uncanny doppelganger. Due to their sameness, every subtle difference is paradoxically amplified and made legible. In other words, although the pieces aim to mirror one another, the handmade and therefore imperfect nature of the slip casting process, as well as the deterioration of the plaster mold over time, ultimately results in perpetual but subtle difference. Instead of attempting to subdue the material, the design research exaggerates the process of decay, of difference and sameness by performing actions of erosion on the mold after each iteration. The resulting cast becomes a snapshot of the changing life of the mold over time. Each cast piece is no longer understood as a duplicate copy of an original. Instead, each piece describes the same object, a single mold from which they were cast, resulting in a problematic superposition. While each cast conceptually occupies different points in time and one point in space, the physicality of each cast discloses the inverse. They exist at one point in time in multiple points in space. Just as the uncanny doppelganger, there is a surplus that produces an infinite relay in space between self and other until they become so disrupted they seem to coincide. But it only seems this way. In fact, their coincidence only amplifies their impossibility of superposition. There are too many multiples, and each multiple, each iteration, articulates the impassable difference made possible by apparent similitude. This paradox names our difficulty with remembering the past. Despite our considerable desire to bring the past into the present, slip casting challenges the tenability of this desire, disrupting our sensibilities about location and material as sites or mediums amenable to authenticating, or at least authentically recalling the past. So in parallel, um, the Beta Real Symposium brings together a diverse group of thinkers and makers to explore the growing shift across disciplines, away from knowable, thinkable, and stable categories, um, and rather towards experienced effect. Through this shift, we explore how architecture can address and negotiate states of simultaneous contradiction, of Janus-based complexity, of contravening positions held in tension, 
at a standstill. Such ambivalent and insurmountable states have come to increasingly characterize our shared reality. From sites of contested memory and amnesia, to economic and identity politics in a global age of displacement, to the scientific and technological revolutions. The beta reel aims to rethink the tensions that our framework of reality leaves in its wake. Finding new equilibriums admits those moments of discord, rather than settling for yet another framework. Uh, through uh, presentations in two panels um, and a roundtable discussion, the Beta Real Symposium participants explore spatial, temporal, and technological sites at the limits of understanding, speech, and architectural imagination, questioning how architecture might move forward at the edge of such a frontier. Distinctly, our frontier does not sit on the edge to some inaccessible, mysterious beyond. In fact, it does not sit on an edge at all, uh, there, for there are no stable boundaries to begin with. Instead, the frontier is situated smack dab in the heart of it all, and yet this heart is also not the center. No, the frontier is not found in a dark, mysterious nucleus. Instead, it's pervasively everywhere, on the edge and in the center at the same time, at every seam of our frameworks and categories of understanding. It is precisely so because the effects of the beta real are in fact produced by those very same structures and categories. It is a haunting from within. It is a feeling that something is not quite right here. Things don't quite fit together. That something or somehow the exterior keeps creeping into the interior of self. At the same time, this experience is hinged on the very separation of an interior and an exterior to begin with. Within the metaphysics of presence, there's just simply no way to reconcile such a con contradiction. Uh, it would view exterior and interior as stable, self-sufficient, unitary categories. The exterior simply cannot also be the interior. Uh, so within that kind of logic, there's no way to move forward beyond that impasse. Um, so in contrast, the beta real posits categorical distinctions as fictional contract, uh, constructs. In doing so, it hopes to reveal exterior and interior as two sides of the same coin, that they may be different and the same simultaneously, and more importantly, that the tension between them may be understood as a productive space. Understanding binary oppositions as related and as experienced affect, rather than things in themselves, the beta real names the not yet completeness, or rather the impossibility to complete project of the real a beta version still in development, always not yet ready for release. Um, so the symposium is structured uh, in three sections. So we have um, the first panel, which is called uh, Destabilizing Sites in Between, and the second, which is uh, titled uh, Inventing Nonfictions, Disrupting Sensibilities. Um, and then we will end with a roundtable discussion, and we'll have uh, a five-minute break um, in between uh, each section. Um, so I'll begin by uh, introducing the theme of the first panel, um, as well as the speakers. Um, so the first panel questions the stable boundaries of reality. Following close readings of Jonas faced experiences between those stable boundaries, the panelists offer new modes of understanding and new imaginaries for sites which have until today remained difficult to fully grasp. Um, the contested space of the road, the American plantation system, and the digital cloud. In an increasingly global, unstable, and complex world, thinking spatially through the ambivalent in between offers a needed alternative mode of architectural thinking and design, expanding our perception and experience of reality. Dwelling in the middle passage, the space between A and B, between multiple points um, of a point cloud, between poles of perpetual contestation and simultaneity, the first panel is framed around a rethinking of the formulation of subjects and objects and the relationships in between them. Looking at the side of the road, Vico Mandela Gray draws upon the ambivalent coinciding of the states of terror and joy, the clearing and yonder, to disrupt the phenomenological experience of the road, announcing its presence. Uh, Natalie Coroner studies the spatial disorientation and impossibility of touch, the inconceivable accuracy of the cloud all of which fall beyond our categories of comprehension. Somewhere simultaneously outside and in between our structures of thought and imagination. Brian Norwood looks at the middle passage between enrootedness and exile to modify the narrative of architectural modernity through the American plantation system. The first panel draws heavily, heavily from philosophy and in particular phenomenology as a way to think through different geographical sites from Canfield Drive in Ferguson to the lower Mississippi River Valley to the non-place of data centers. 
Rather than applied philosophy, which uses philosophy as a lens to conveniently frame architecture, the three presentations explore how philosophical thinking can be used to challenge assumptions and structures of architectural thought and design, as well as making. Each presentation opens up possibilities within architectural thought for critiquing systems of power, production, infrastructure, by calling to question subject-object relations, namely the instable constructions of identity, history, and temporality. Um, so just quickly before I introduce um, the panelists, I want to introduce um, our moderator, uh, Irene Chin. I also want to give her a huge thank you. We've spent many hours um, together discussing reading, writing, um, and putting together the two panels and roundtable discussion um, here today. And she is incredibly humble and will never admit um, to her how, how um, instrumental she has been to the symposium. Uh, but without her thoughtful, attentive, and critical framing, um, and professional questioning. Um, none of this today would be possible. So thank you, Irene. Um, so Irene Chin is an editor and curator currently based in Montreal, Quebec. Uh, she was trained as an architect at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York, and went on to study history and philosophy of design at Harvard University. Uh, through the practice of design research, exhibition, and publication making, she explores her interest of archive theory, media archaeology, and muse museology. Her interests lie in the intersection of architectural and institutional criticism, questioning formal and abstract structures of cultural production. Uh, she has contributed to exhibitions at the Art Institute of Chicago and Harvard University, and has experience with grants and public programming at major institutions, including the Storefront for Art and Architecture, the Architecture Foundation and the Graham Foundation. Um, and most recently, she is the curator, cur curatorial coordinator at the Canadian Center of Architecture and has worked on exhibitions including Archaeology of the Digital, 17 Volcanoes, Besides History, uh, Mirrors, Mirrors, <laughs> and um, Great Stones, Tools for Understanding the City. And so, uh, arriving at our uh, first panel, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Biko Mandela Gray, who is sitting in, in front of me here. Um, Biko is a professor of American religion here at Syracuse University. Um, his interests are primarily organized around the connection between religion, embodiment, and subjectivity, and how these different dimensions of our lives are both augmented and inflected through categories like race, gender, and sexuality. Returning to sites of black life and death, Biko highlights how the Black Lives Matter movement operates as a site of religious subject formation, drawing upon phenomenological thinkers such as uh, Levinas, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, and Ahmed, um, and placing them in conversation with Toni Morrison, he examines the Black Lives Matter movement as a clearing, a religious space beyond the confines of the cognitive and conscious subject of mastery, wherein black flesh is revered, loved, and cared for despite the ever-present possibility and various forms of death. This cl the clearing challenges traditional approaches to subjectivity, highlighting that subjectivity can and does extend far beyond constitution or cognition. Instead, subjectivity should be understood as relation, as a constantly changing constellation of varied modes of relational engagement. Um, our second uh, panelist is Natalie Coroner. Uh, she is a PhD candidate at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts uh, School of Architecture in Copenhagen. Um, her research focuses on spatiality, temporality, and the ma materiality of digital archives. Uh, she previously studied architecture at Cambridge University and at the ETH in Zurich, um, and she has worked for architecture firms in London, in Zurich, including Zaha Hadid, um, Jan Goyer, uh, as well as um, Olaf, Studio Olaf Erleason. Um, and she is uh, recently joining us from uh, the New School uh, and uh, Parsons, where she has been a visiting scholar uh, since January. Um, and last but not least, um, Brian Norwood uh, is a PhD candidate in the history and theory of architecture at Harvard University, um, as well as a visiting assistant professor at Mississippi State University School of Architecture. Um, he was the 2016 to 2017 Charles uh, Peterson Senior Fellow at the Athenaeum in Philadelphia. Uh, he received a BA in philosophy and a BArch uh, from Mississippi State University, and an MA in philosophy from Boston University, and an MA in architecture from Harvard. Um, he is also taught at Harvard, Northeastern, and BU. Um, he, his work has appeared in uh, many journals, and he has um, most recently edited, 
edited the next issue of Vlog, which is it still on an airplane or is it arriving soon? It will be in New York on Monday, so we're all um, really looking forward to that issue, which is also on uh, phenomenology and disorienting, uh, disorienting phenomenology with phenomenology. Um, all right, so um, to start off each panel, um, I'm going to introduce the work of um, some workshops we did. So from both panels, um, Annie, Lou, and Buchum and Delagray have done workshops um, with my classes, with my students. Um, and so uh, Buchum and Delagray started out by doing a four-week workshop um, in my PE class, uh, but he had such a good time, he's not leaving and is continuing. So it's a never-ending semester-long workshop now. Um, so I'll begin by introducing some of that work, um, which will lead into uh, their own work. Um, so it, the workshop was entitled Phenomenology of the Road. Um, through the ar archeology span and excavation of colored slip, the iterative tiles explore the phenomenology of the road as a space where the residue of violence remains. We look specifically at the site of Canfield Drive in Ferguson, which still bears the residue, blood, and DNA of the violence and violation that ended Mike Brown's life. The struggle of remembrance and erasure, which plays out over the built environment, um, names the impasse of the road. The workshop uses the performative and time-based dimensions of slip casting processes to reveal the affective dimensions of the road. Um, so what you see in the photos here is the site where his body bled out for several hours. Um, and interestingly, um, you'll see the photos of some of the memorials that were made, um, and they all miraculously went missing or destroyed somehow. So the, um, the stuffed animals and dolls you see were uh, mysteriously burnt away, um, and they also, it also burnt down a tree. And so then a tree was planted with a plaque um, as a commemorative um, gesture, and that was uh, stolen within 24 hours. And so in this site, we really see the contested nature in which you have to confront the fact that every time you try to remember one narrative, it is violently forgetting another. And this is the space in which that is played out. Um, and when you see uh, that asphalt being poured, uh, the family wanted to keep the piece of the road in which his blood had saturated. Uh, so they dug out that block. Um, and uh, they wanted to actually use it as his headstone, but it was too crumbly. Um, but as a result, um, they had to pave a, a new patch of asphalt in that space, um, which sort of um, reveals itself um, to you in the road as you pass. Um, so Biko will talk um, a bit more about that. Um, and so um, starting with the topographical surface, surface of the site, uh, thin layers of color slip are cast into a plaster mold. Um, exploring how actions performed during casting can be revealed through excavations, these actions relate to the contested nature and the violence of interpretation surrounding the ways in which Mike Brown's life ended. By excavating and smoothing out the initial surface, the process of layering the colored slip will be revealed, leaving traces of the initial texture behind as color rather than form. Um, so in other words, the topographic casts of the layered colored slip were excavated to reveal layers of color that remain as traces even the, in the wake of its destruction. So without further ado, um, I will present Biko Mandela Gray. Do you want to stand up or sit down? I don't know how to... Whatever you want to do. Okay. Yeah. Um, There's a clicker if you don't want to oh. Yeah, that's, yeah, I'm going to, there's a lot going on here. How about I do that? All right, you guys. Good afternoon, everybody. First, I want to say thanks to everybody. First, for you guys for being here. Second, to um, my partner in crime, uh, Linda, who um, decided, we, she mentioned uh, one time, uh, Edmund Husserl, when we first got here last semester, and I said, oh, you read him too. Let's see uh, what might shake out. So we ended up uh, somehow doing a workshop together, uh, or she just invited me to do something. So that's ended up, that was um, incredible. So I do want to give it up to Linda again. Thank you um, for, your, for your work. I do have written remarks, uh, and so I will use them, uh, but I will use them sparingly. Uh, the, the title of this piece is called Road Trip. 
Um, and so I'll start read by reading things and then eventually I'll move away from the text and come back and forth. So don't be confused by my movement. It's part um, of the process. Four and a half hours. Pearson broken, his body lay there for four and a half hours. His blood spilling into the asphalt and leaving permanent stains. We no longer see them there because the family uh, took his residue, removed his remains from the possibility of travel. Days later, we heard cries of burn this bitch down by Mike Brown's father. And they did. A CVS went up in flames and property was damaged. And then came the tanks. Armed with tear gas, armed with tear gas wielding, militarily addressed police officers, the city and then the country split in at least two. And somehow, somehow, we've never overcome this splitting. These four and a half hours and the moments leading up to these four and a half hours uh, remain contested sites structured by what we might call the hermeneutical impasse of American sociocultural memory. Was Mike Brown a violent criminal who accosted Darren Wilson? Or was he a college hopeful who died too soon? As a collective reality, as a collective country, we don't know where to land. And as I will suggest today, we never will, because we do not know what to do with asphalt, with concrete, with the road. And so what I'll do is, in light of this today, I want us to take a road trip. Brief road trip. We're going to go to go to a couple of roads. Uh, and to, it's to clarify where, uh, where I'm headed, I will lay the road map, all puns intended. Did y'all get the joke? Dun, 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 dun. All puns intended ahead of us. First, uh, the road op operates as an expression and denial of Heideggerian notions of equipment. It simultaneously functions and fails to function. And in this regard, it opens up new possibilities of reading Heidegger. Uh, but I want, in, th in this regard, the road is ambiguous. And so second, I want to suggest that the very ambiguity of the road in its obscurity, uh, it relies upon affect, emotion, in order to bring the road's in existence into sharper relief. So because the road itself is obscure, and I'll talk about what that obscuration means, we rely upon, we rely upon our affective impulses, our emotions, to help us further understand the road. And lastly, uh, after doing that, um, I will eventually show uh, that I want to leave us where we started. If the road needs affect, needs emotion to disclose the nature of its, exist its existence, then the mere fact that the road is a conduit for both rage and apathy, for both disgust and safety, uh, then this reinforces that in this country, the real, whatever this term may come to mean, must wrestle with uncertainty and must refuse to clearly categorize or arrive as a moment of clarity. The road is, after all, a space for travel. Produced by some, some solid material, usually asphalt, the road is that silent medium, that purportedly neutral milieu through which we are able to move from one place to another. When it's working well, when there are no potholes, you all know what potholes do to your road, right, or to your driving, uh, the road fades into the background. Enamored by our uh, destination, our surroundings, or our riding companions, or maybe some combination of all of these things, the road recedes into the horizon, operating as the very uh, medium of and for contemplation, conversation, or navigation. We know the road is really doing its job when we forget that it's there. Or at least this is what Martin Heidegger might suggest. So I want you all to do me a favor. What are you all sitting in right now? It's a very basic question. Please don't make me uh, force somebody to ask this question. There we go. We are sitting in chairs. And until I mentioned that we were sitting in chairs, how many of you all knew, rem remembered that you were sitting in chairs? Raise your hand if you were like, man, I've been sitting in a chair this whole time. <laughs> right? You don't even think about that, right? You might have thought about it if you if your backside started to hurt a little bit, if the cushion gave out, right? But, but most of the time, these things recede into the background. And Martin Heidegger says that things do their best job when we forget that they are things. The chair is operating properly. We're sitting in it. 
And so I wanted to think through this because in many ways, the road operates the same way, right? If you get on the road and there are no potholes, all of a sudden the car does fine. You start thinking with your buddy, you turn on some Kendrick Lamar, right? You understand? You start listening to DNA or you listen to the, uh, to the Black Panther soundtrack, everything goes well, right? When you're listening and driving on the road, it recedes and you forget about it. Except that for many people, we never forget about it. For many people, for certain communities, the road is not a space that recedes from view, whether it has potholes or not. For many of us, the road is always a place of fraught anxiety, of brokenness. And I'm not talking about potholes or, or, or uneven pavement. Uh, 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 what happens is, is that the road can and does refuse to, re to, uh, to recede from view. And so while we don't typically think of it in this way, there are moments where in the, the, the road refuses to disappear. And in this regard, I'm not talking about potholes or uneven pavement. I'm talking about moments when the names of streets are invoked. Not for navigation, but because, of the, name, but because the name of the street announces the halt of navigation, the, cease, the ceasing of movement. Indeed, there are moments when, the, when roads announce themselves because they occasion the ceasing of life itself. So I'll name a couple of streets. Canfield Drive in Ferguson, in Ferguson Missouri, you all know that one. Uh, you also know University Drive in Prairie View, Texas, or maybe you don't. Presbury Street in Baltimore, North Foster Drive in Baton, Lu Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or 41st Street in Pulaski Road in Chicago. Each one of the names of these streets, I know them because they announce a place where movement stopped. Where a body is laid in the ground for four and a half hours. The names of these roads may ring a bell, may not ring a bell, but the following names of those who were killed on them do. Mike Brown, Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray, Alton Sterling, Laquan McDonald, who was shot 16 times in the middle of night. And uh, for each of these names, it was the asphalt, the road, that stood as a conduit for both travel and violence. They were moving on the road until it stopped. And sometimes the road conjures up images, instead of images of, of road trips, sometimes it conjures up images of pierced bodies whose blood spills on the asphalt. Sometimes the road reminds us of slammed, pinned down, and choked bodies whose expiration becomes increasingly Im imminent. Sometimes one can look at the road and hear the bones of someone's spine snapping, even if we've never seen the person. For some of us, the road is not a neutral medium of and for travel. Instead, the road announces itself as a conduit fraught with anxiety to the point where parents become supplemental teachers in driver's education courses. And there are many of us who might be familiar with something that I'm about to say. My mom used to tell me when I got my driver's license, hey baby, don't speed, and I'll be speeding anyway, right? And she goes, I know you're gonna speed, so when you get stopped by the cops, got a couple rules for you. Keep your hands on the wheel, put your eyes down, always say yes sir and no sir, right? Because the road is a space fraught with anxiety. And yet we know, don't we, that there are many of us, other communities, that do find the road to be a space of safety, where the road does recede into the background, where peace officers are not understood as agents of death. And in this particular reality, both of these particular perspectives operate simultaneously on the asphalt. Hence these weird images that you all are looking at that are eerily beautiful because they announce contradictions. They announce that some folks find the road to be safe while others find the road to be anxiety inducing. And so what do we do with the road? I'm going to go ahead and move down because I don't have too much time. What eventually happens here is that the road announces the possibility of feeling either at home or not at home. And it does both of these things at the same time, such that when I drive down the road and I see the red, white, and blues, I freak the hell out, right? But others may see the red, white, and blues and say, I am safe. And we both might be riding in the car together and I'm over here sitting next to my buddy who's like, yes, and I'm like, no, right? And what do you do with this, with this ambiguity, with this obscurity of the road? It fails to follow logic. 
It fails to follow what Aristotle calls the rule of non-contradiction, that something must be the same thing in the same place at all times. And so eventually what you have to think about when thinking about the road is how do we feel? What emotions arise when we think about the road? Sarah Ahmed says that emotions form surfaces. If you don't know who Sarah Ahmed is, come holler at me after. Sarah Ahmed says emotions form surfaces, and, and because they form surfaces, certain emotions will form the road as a space of safety or a space of danger. And so for some of us, relaxation is cool, but for some of us, for, for others of us, and I don't know how to do this fancy thing, uh, for others of us, and I will move it here, the road incites rage. Black rage is founded on two-thirds a person, great things and beatings and suffering and worsens, black human packages tied up in strings, black rage can come from all these kinds of things. Black rage is founded on blatant denial, squeeze economics, Subsistence survival, deafening silence, and social control. Black rage is found in all wounds in the soul. When the dogs bite, when the you all don't need to see the video because it just says black rage over and over again. If you all are familiar with the song, you may not be. This is Lauryn Hill. The title of the song is Black Rage. And it gave you the first part of it. It's, it's put to my favorite things. And the lyrics essentially say that black rage is founded upon a series of violence and violations that happen to black folks. And we remember these things and eventually we don't fear so bad. But if the road operates as a space of rage or possible rage, AKA burn this bitch down, as Mike Brown's father said. Then it also operates as a space, a, a, a felt space where protection resides, such that the Blue Lives Matter movement, in response to the Black Lives Matter movement, is nothing more and nothing less than an also an oppositional emotional response. It's an emotional response about who gets to claim the road, about who gets to claim this public space. It is a demand of ownership over public spaces, such that the road confirms and denies the legitimacy of police and protest, of joy and suffering, of violence and safety simultaneously. Marked by opposition called into being through an insurmountable struggle, the road reminds us that we will never come to a national consensus about the ethics of these kinds of deaths. Mike Brown will never be resolved as either a criminal or a college hopeful. Sandra Bland will never be understood as is simply a drug addict or an activist. If space offers us an arena from which to contemplate the real, then the ambiguity of the road offers us a considerable source from within which to further understand the contours and complications of our lives lived together. And so I'll end with this, such that the real, the reality of something, if we are to wrestle with this, is far more complex than the simplicity of the term might convey. If we think about the real in relation to the road, the best we could say, if we could say anything at all, is that what the real is, like the road, is always an already contested terrain. Given up to one, always and already, open to and for the violence of interpretation, the violence that is interpretation. And yet some of us might argue that we have little other than interpretation through which to understand the world. Even though the road is a fraught sociocultural and sociopolitical terrain, we still have to use it. I still got to drive. The real, then, already places us at an impasse, at an obscure standoff. But I guess that's just how things are. Maybe it's time to take another road trip. Thank you.
This one. So I try. Okay. Can you hear me? Is this loud enough? Yeah, okay. So, um, my research in architecture theory resolves around the digital cloud. And um, basically, I'm using the meteorological and the geological as two modes to describe digital archives. And I'm interested in what kinds of spaces we associate with the digital cloud. So what is behind this cloud metaphor and how can we as architects use and enrich it? So if according to a Google image search, um, this is what the digital cloud looks like. It's basically a um, meteorological cloud photoshopped into a rendered corridor um, of server racks. And there's like many variations of this. Um, it can also be vice versa with data racks photoshopped into clouds. The term cloud, um, even in the context of digital archiving practices and data analysis, suggests meteorology as a kind of methodological and spatial temporal point of reference. I explore and describe the spatiality, temporality, and materiality of the digital cloud by creating an analogy with the meteorological cloud as it is more real than the digital cloud, which is just a metaphor for data centers, which look like this. Um, so if we look at the clouds, 67% of the planet are continuously covered by clouds. So we're actually living on a cloudy marble rather than the blue marble. The meteorological cloud can be understood materially as an archive. It consists of water and transports the particles onto which water condensates, the aerosols. These transmit a variety of physical information, for example, of deserts, here of mushrooms, of forests, um, of nuclear events, explosions, volcanic activity, and CO2 pollutants. This physical information travels. For example, dust from the Sahara often tra traverses the atmosphere above the Atlantic to reach the Caribbean via clouds. Aerosols, fine solids and droplets, vary in size from a few nanometers, less than the width of the smallest viruses, to about the diameter of human hair. 90% of them occur naturally, 10% are anthropogenic. The information clouds carry constitutes their materiality and influences their spatial formation. A single cloud might assemble volcanic ash, pollen, sea salt, and soot. This mix will in turn determine how much heat the cloud retains or reflects and when it precipitates as rain. The morphology of clouds is in constant flux, so their spatiality continuously changes, just as their chemical and physical composition also does. They are difficult to classify, and prior to 1802, um, the meteorological clouds were similarly enigmatic and mysterious as the digital cloud, which basically is um, invisible, non-ionizing microwaves um, that occupy the imagination of its users. This changed when um, pharmacist and amateur meteorologist Luke Howard developed a nomenclature for clouds. And the revolutionary aspect of his system was that it classified these entities that aren't objects in themselves or fixed in themselves, but that are the, quote, visible signs of at vast atmospheric processes. His three basic um, categories of clouds, zero stratus and nimbus, reflected atmospheric processes instead of their resulting shapes and could be combined to describe further cloud variations. So while Howard could study clouds from only from below, we have now access to cloud studies from above with the help of satellites. And these satellites show just how responsive clouds are. So um, cloud patterns reflect the topography and temperature of the planet's surface. 
its reflectivity, ships and airplanes, um, winds and atmospheric pressure. So one good example of the responsiveness of clouds are these wave cloud formations, um, which uh, visualize the collision of air masses of different temperatures and moisture content. So when a very, by comparative, comparison tiny island pushes up air masses that then meet higher air masses you get these patterns uh, and there's like lots of different so basically um, looking at cloud patterns points to two archival aspects of the meteorological cloud on the one hand there's the information embedded in the particles their origin, travels, and interactions. On the other hand, there's the continuously changing context of the cloud. A cloud visualizes its surroundings and by extension, the world. This notion resonates with the origins of computing as closely linked to the air as archive. Charles Babbage, the so-called father of computers, was an important figure in setting this trend. He declared, quote, the air itself is one vast library of all the words that have been spoken and all the winds and currents that have acted upon it. His view of the world as archive was informed by his computational logic that also led <coughs> to his inventions that you can see in the back. Um, these were the earliest computers. Um, according to Babbage, when we speak, we set airwaves into irreversible motion, affecting every atom of the atmosphere and changing their trajectories forever in, quote, less than 20 hours. So Babbage believed that given enough computational power, um, knowledge of the air's behavior and causes acting on it, the atmosphere's past and future trajectories can be deduced. The air, in Babbage's view, is an archive, a visualization of the forces that act on it, just as the clouds are responsive visualizations of extensive information and processes. However, unlike in Babbage's idealized world, clouds for us today, the meteorological clouds, are still unmappable and impossible to compute or model. Despite their continuous presence, they remain fundamentally elusive because clouds visualize immense amount of data, not all of which is fully understood by science. Um, this data is in constant flux of updates as it interacts with other elements. As a planetary phenomenon embedded in meteorological time oh, that um, con consists of phasing, cyclicity, recurrence and variation, flux and patterning, clouds exemplify the meteorological mode. Um, so, I just want to show you a video going back to... Um, so this is a Shutterstock image of um, a data center visualization. So whereas the appearance of the meteorological cloud depends on the relations of otherwise invisible atmospheric parameters, wind, temperature, humidity, and aerosols. The digital cloud offers a powerfully blurry visualization of data centers, glass fibers, and microwaves that are so generic and interchangeable that they might just as well not exist. Um, so. The, the digital cloud also blurs the terrain of big data, which it contains. Big data is, like the meteorological cloud, too vast for models. It refers to exponentially growing digital data volumes harvested from many digital Earth sources and sensors, digitizers, scanners, numerical modeling, phones, internet, etc. Without going into too much detail, at the core of the digital cloud lies its ability to absorb and consume seemingly endless information. So, oh, I have to find my... Um, uh -oh. <coughs> no, that's not me. <laughs> Sorry, I just have to go back. Um, I can't find it. Where's the... Can you just do that? <coughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. So, um, 
so how can we grapple with this elusive metaphorical quality of the digital cloud and its data centers? And now I'll talk a bit about my own re like, um, artistic research. So one approach to make this more real is through its materiality. And I'm basically interested in using these kinds of renderings as a starting point to then explore how you can make them more tangible. And one approach is through the material. So um, the data centers and the service and um, all our digital technologies are actually made of minerals and metals and rare earth. So what the stuff that the ground is made of. So what we build our architecture on. And um, what does that look like? We never really are in contact with the kind of raw material before it's processed. And there's um, a fascinating world kind of in the actual material. So this is a lithium pool. Um, this is what rare earth mineral mines look like. And then there's these kind of abstract visualizations of um, these uh, metals. And I w thought, how can I use this to kind of make it tangible in a more architectural context? And, and one way of actually using these minerals and kind of uh, buildings has been to stain glass. So traditionally, glass is stained using a variety of minerals. And I then also, um, this is just like four examples of, so I made these small samples of um, using just float glass and applying the kinds of metals and mineral powders that we find in our digital technologies and baking them onto the glass using different kind of uh, sponges and methods of applying them to kind of deal with the uh, metallic materiality of the digital technologies and a kind of cloudy aesthetic. And my, so my next step will be to actually um, apply glass panels to the kind of cupboard systems, the generic cupboards that um, rack uh, systems that we use in data centers, which look like this. They come in different sizes, but um, they adhere to certain standards. And uh, so I kind of go into a um, history of these organizing archival cupboards. And one of them is Carl Linnaeus's original herbarium cabinet. So when he was coming up with a classification of all organic life, he, instead of binding the sheets with pressed flowers into books, as people did at the time, he kept the, the sheets in a, in a cupboard to rearrange them kind of spatially, which allowed him to classify plants and animals in a more spatial way. And then there's also these, these kind of core memory units of the first um, large room-filling computers. So basically, I want to kind of bring together the materiality and the spatial organization of cupboards to, exp to give these completely abstract renderings uh, realness. In a way. So that will be my next step. And um, I've been looking at other archival spaces that are more tangible than data centers. So the Earth can be understood as a geoinformatic construct, and one place that shows this pretty well is the Lamont de Hurdy Earth Observatory of Columbia University, where they keep um, earth sediment cores. So sediment cores are basically drilling samples from the ocean floor, from the ground, um, which you just you use a plastic tube and gravity basically to get these sediment samples out. And these are then archived in in basically rooms as big as this, just filled with um, shelves and eight or five foot long drilling core samples. And um, now they mostly dried also, uh, they're refrigerated so that the moisture content stays the same. But I'm really interested in these spaces that kind of use geology just like data centers, but in a more tangible way because when you, when you look at this image, these are, so you have to imagine like five foot long halves of drilling cores and there's uh, labels on them which actually have some meaning. They denote the ship 
from which these uh, samples were taken and when and so on. Um, and when we look at what a server like hard drive, um, disk platters are made of, they're also geoinformatic constructs, just like the planet and just like these drilling cores. So I want to kind of explore um, archival material um, in this more tangible way. Because uh, how can we render the digital real and spatial and get away from these very abstract and kind of, yeah, renderings? All right, I'm on. I just gave away everything. <laughs> Lecture is pointless. OK. Um, so hi, I'm Brian. Uh, I also want to say thank you to Linda. This is such a great opportunity. Um, what I actually want to start with is this diagram from Christian Norberg Schultz, an architectural theorist uh, from the 1970s book, uh, Existence, Space, and Architecture. So this is his diagram of a subject oriented in the world. So you have on your left, the subject uh, is oriented towards a place in, that's circumscribed in the world. But inside of that place that's circumscribed is a reflection of the subject themselves. So we might could say, like our uh, friend or nemesis, Mr. Heidegger, um, if he's the subject in Norberg Schultz's kind of this general interpretation of phenomenology and architecture is what I'm trying to lay out right here. If he's the subject, then Heidegger's famous hut in the woods is this thing that makes place for him. But the reason that makes place is because there's a miniature version of Heidegger kind of envisioned inside of this. That under, the way we understand being in the world, the way we understand to, it means, what it means to exist as a human in the world is to be at home. But I'm interested in a different diagram. This is a diagram from the Caribbean philosopher and poet Edward Glissant's uh, book, The Poetics of Relation, and it's meant to show the middle passage. It's a diagram of subjects stolen away from Africa, bound together in the belly of a slave ship, carried along the middle passage, and spread out across plantations of the Caribbean and the Americas. Alexander Weyla uh, in Habeas Fiscus has recently challenged us to approach questions of embodiment, so questions of phenomenology, by thinking what alternate forms human existence take under these sort of conditions, the, uh, particularly these of uh, the racialized middle passage, the plantation, and its continued effects on the world. Duress emerges here as a, a feature of this alternate form of subjectivity. It takes shape in a world that is defined, colonized, and oriented by whiteness. I think there's two potentially valuable uh, lessons for architectural history here. First, uh, in a very historical form, we need to understand the built environment's role in the formation of racial capitalism. It requires us to make colonialism and racialization explicit themes of architectural history. But theoretically, and more at issue for me here today, is the possibility of formulating an understanding of human existence through phenomenology that, as the French philosopher Dorothy Legrand says, rejects the binary of enrootedness and exile. So a sizable part of the uh, binary of phenomenology versus post-structuralism or phenomenology versus deconstruction that kind of tangled up uh, architectural theory discourse in the 90s was based on this idea that phenomenology is about being enrooted, but if you do deconstruction or post-structuralism, you're thinking about exile. I think what's potentially powerful about Glissant and uh, Whaley is this kind of formulation in a way of understanding a particular kind of human existence that is neither enrooted in a world that is uh, entirely theirs, nor is it exiled in a way that they're entirely not at home. So the way I'm gonna go to this is by talking about the plantation uh, of the lower Mississippi River Valley in the 18th century and the 19th century. So a phenomenological account of the body on the plantation requires paying particular attention to a kind of distinction between the lived body 
and the body as experienced. So the lived body is this first category that's quintessential to phenomenology. It describes the body experienced as intentional and projective, our body as we engage in the world, as we don't notice the chair there that supports us. This is what Merleau-Ponty calls the body schema. But there's another body, the objectified body. It's the body as an object for others. It's brought into particular relief by experiences of gender and race. Thus, has more carefully been considered by phenomenologies written from these perspectives. So the feminist Iris Marion Young described this experience as being a directional marker for others. Sarah Achman describes this as a process of uh, the disoriented person becoming the orient for whiteness and straightness. Uh, Franz Fanon famously described this experience as his body being disjointed and reassembled, fabricated by and for another person's world. And George Yancey has recently labeled this condition the phenomenological return, which is not simply the process of being objectified, but rather the experience of one who is objectified having their lived intentionality being reformed by this objectification. So this system of racialized slavery that took place in the plantations of the Old South is a really good way to put this phenomenological disjunction on display. So let's take this quote as an example from the landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted describing a journey through the South. He said, it's difficult to handle simply as property a creature possessing human passions and feelings, however debased and torpid the condition of that creature may be. While on the other hand, the absolute necessity of dealing with property as a thing greatly embarrasses a man in any attempt to treat it as a person. It is this natural result of this complicated state of things that the system of slave management is irregular, ambiguous, and contradictory, that is never either consistently humane or consistently economical. So here we have a hint at what might be different about an approach to architectural history that understands our initial contacts with modernity in a way that routes not through the factory, but through the plantation. The process is not just techno-scientific objectification that many phenomenologists have complained about, but rather one of the kind of contradictions of racialized exploitation, of understanding certain humans as different and therefore deficient. The body of the enslaved person is lived as one constantly returned to itself by the view of whiteness of it as less human. For the enslaved person then, we can say, and perhaps even more broadly for racialized and gendered persons, being in a place is doubled by an objectifying process of knowing one's place. So the system of the uh, plantation can be kind of thought about in this uh, cross section. The conversion of the volatile environmental space of the Mississippi River Delta into predictable and financially productive landscape depended on a variety of things like levees, drainage ditches, docks and steamboats, techniques of planting, harvesting, producing raw commodities. The native people of the Mississippi River Valley understood the environment as one of variability and their control as tenuous. Water rose and fell, the divisions of wet and dry shifted. The story of European colonization of this area is essentially one of attempting to fix the separation of wet and dry, to take land prone to instability and make it stable. The plantation system attempted to produce a productive order uh, that was ultimately embodied in the view to and from the seat of power, the big house. On the plantation, the boundary is one of the key tools of whiteness in maintaining systematic order. However, as Glissant says, while the plantation constructs a specific boundary and order, boundaries are also the point of weakness. When the environment of the lower Mississippi River Valley was not made for the enslaved, in most cases it was made by them, and its spaces in which they existed. Their form of existence cut across alternate paths in this landscape. The axial approach, the famous kind of shots of these plantations that would come from this side, was not for them, that was for other white people. The slave's approach cut across this kind of back system and ordered itself differently in relationship to the field, to the yard, uh, to their quarters. The quarters themselves and their small gardens became spaces of defense and personal identity. But importantly, it's the spaces at the margin of this system of control between the plantation and the swamp that structural weakness is revealed as these kind of spaces that we can find alternate forms of human agency. 
So how was disorientation resisted? Well, first, you could resist it by, uh, by running away. The runaway directly confronted their bodily division by trying to suture it back together. The activity of running away was one of trying to relieve oneself of being torn in two, of being a lived body and a body objectified. The linguistic and legal acrobatics used by planters to describe runaways in this sense is pretty revealing. They would say things like, this slave absconded with themselves, or they were stealing themselves away. They fled in order to reunite what had been divided. However, this is not the only form of resistance. And the way of resistance uh, that we conceive is ultimately linked to what kind of bodies we imagine resisting. So the uh, scholar Stephanie Camp in this analysis uh, and Closer to Freedom emphasized enslaved agency by looking at further constraints from which they began. Permanent escape was much more common for uh, men than women. Further bound by the institutions of family and domestic care that likewise affected white women, the enslaved woman's body was a site of domination both in terms of race and gender. But Camp develops an account of the enslaved woman's body as a particular means of resistance and celebration, as a body that formed what Glissant described as poetic relations. In particular, she does this by conceptualizing the body as a trichotomy rather than a dichotomy. The enslaved woman's body was a site of domination, a body experienced as dominated, and importantly, and thirdly, a body claimed and enjoyed as a site of resistance. As she points out, the contested space of the swamp was particularly activated by resistant activities of women. They sought temporary truancy in the swamp, but they also supported other people's truancy and escape by providing food grown or stolen from the plantation through keeping secrets. Parties and religious gatherings, which took place in clearings in the swamp, uh, sometimes called hush arbors, were prepared in advance. Food and alcohol was stolen, uh, clothing created, bodies to be expressive. The space of the resistant body was in the disorientation of the swamp, and its paths led out to the space of the plantation, where goods and affects could be gathered. It was a place in which the planter's organizational system ran up against its limits. It was a margin that planters no doubt attempted to control, uh, to broach by the imposition of carceral order through things such as safe patrols, written passes, and tracking dogs, but as one in which they could not entirely dominate. Ultimately, the margin, the space of exile from one system, was also the means of enrooting another set of relations. The third body converted the experience of domination into a site of resistance. So I want to ask, how do we write narratives of both the lived body and the body for others into architecture? It's a pressing question for how we think about modernity. Our accounts must not be written or read in a way that fetishizes experience of transgression. The process of running away, for example, was one of totalizing disorientation. The experience of being caught by tracking dogs, one of unparalleled horror. Disorientation is not simply an experience to celebrate any more than that of orientation. An aestheticized transgression is a process of using another's disorientation to reaffirm colonizing orientations. Aestheticizing our relation to disorientation asks too little of the oriented whiteness and demands too much of those that are disoriented. So our account of architecture, if we're going to take it seriously, for one, is going to require us to think about phenomenologies of race. When Massimo Cacciari called for a phenomenology of metropolitan non-dwelling, it was still an account of the alienation of the European white male. So, Mises is who he was talking about at the moment. The plantation were understood as quintessential of a space of modernity as the factory or the office building. This would modify the narrative of modernity and architectural modernism. So while mechanization was taking command, as Siegfried Gideon famously described it, so did the internal slave trade and the KKK, Jim Crow, the Army Corps of Engineers, flood control strategies, and eventually the petrochemical facilities that have turned the lower Mississippi River Valley into what is called Cancer Alley. We can ask the questions of our responsibility in terms of the experience of these places today, too. How do you make a visit to the remains of plantations in a way that does not reproduce the planter's system of visibility and carceral control? Phenomenology as a tool of historic preservation would require that we conceive of the task 
uh, or we conceive of our task as one of making us aware of what has been hidden. Along the river road of the lower Mississippi, what gets covered up and withdrawn in the process of historical change? Well, sugar bowling kettles are turned into fountains and planters. Tour guides dress in period costumes. Houses are decorated for the holidays. And tales recounted of the families and their possessions that occupied the big house. Plantation alleys provide spaces for wedding photo opportunities that you pay to have access to. But a first step is also occurring at the Whitney Plantation uh, in Louisiana. It's the first plantation museum to focus on slavery. The approach begins at a church built by and for the enslaved, an architectural manifestation of the hush arbors that were in the swamps. The journey then follows the middle passage to the slave cabins and then through the yard to the back of the big house. The approach is that of the enslaved rather than the placated visitor or the planter. So finally, if phenomenology is going to have relevance for architectural theory in a way that does not fetishize claims about enrooted primitivity or modern exile, it has to think about bodies in multiples, and at least two, but maybe threes. The point is not to equivocate on the experience of slavery. Rather, what we need to think about is how we choose the historical moments from which we begin our accounts of subjectivity. In particular, we need to think about how we choose our moments of what Agamben called bare life, or of life under extreme duress. This is Wayle's argument for black feminist theories of the human, and likewise the reason an account of the middle passage in the plantation could be so important to architectural thought. Thank you. All right, can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear? All right, we're gonna slowly uh, get started again. Okay. Those of you that are in the back, there's still more room in the front, so you can feel free to come closer if you wish. Um, so for the, the second panel is entitled Inventing Nonfiction, Disrupting Sensibilities. Um, so if the first panel looked at the space between things, uh, the second panel uses the beta reel to test the multi-layered and superpositioned space between two states, uh, that, of uh, that of fiction and reality. So drawing from literature, art, politics, technology, and science, the panel looks for ways in which, um, as William Stewart aptly framed it, nothing is real that isn't fiction. This contradictory structure is precisely the structure of the in-between, of the beta reel. Uh, we explored the, the same beta reel in-between we explored in the first panel. Uh, it is the structure of the doppelganger, which is at once you and at once not you. Uh, it is not simply ambiguous, but rather ambivalent, a superposition. It is precisely both opposing things at the same time. Just as in the first panel, the point is not to try to resolve these tensions and oppositions, or even to explore the liminality, but rather to understand the superpositions of their difference as constitutive elements of reality to see them as an invitation to dwell within the space of ambivalent impasse. So Annie Liu amplifies while simultaneously undermining sensual experience. Her work explores the ways in which scientific and technological revolutions shift and shape the experiences of longing, nostalgia, and sexuality. She uses the tools of science and technology in her artistic praxis to turn so-called objective truths on their head by injecting biological impulse with effect. Uh, Yolandi uses a material imaginary through the process of weaving to non-fictionalize and announce the textile through the thread, rendering visible the vast spatial dimensions of production, labor, and value behind textiles. William Stewart considers how social, political, and economic structures and the restructurings have impacted cultural consciousness and subject formation. Drawing upon literal and political realities, he sheds light on the voice of journalism and media exploring the role in world making and creating identity through myth and false lies. He explores the schizophrenic experience of reality as manifest through the impasse of access and lack. So the second panel focuses on co the contestation between subjectivity and objectivity in order to challenge the notion of a singular reality. Challenging the ways Singular notions of reality necessarily uproot things from their context, objectifying them and violently oversimplifying our experience of them. 
looking at the impasse between objective um, and subjective truth, fiction and speculation, real and unreal, the second panel aims to disrupt sensibilities. Their presentations announce new forms of coherence and unities, which make room for the complexity and contradictory nature of our experience of reality, as well as the associative nature of memory. In recognizing that multiple realities exist simultaneously in superposition, and that each reality does not make the other less real, these speakers explore new forms of stability, unity, and equilibrium between the tangible and in intangible, between the material and immaterial. Through the beta reel, their work reveals how things are much more connected than we like to give credit to. Sometimes just because we simply do not have the nomenclature for it all, sometimes because of the technical limitations of our technology and science, sometimes because violent simplifications is a necessary process in orienting ourselves in this world. Keenly aware of this, their work offers insightful ways of thinking with and through the layered alterity beyond fictional delineations and the boundaries we place on reality. Um, so now I will pr uh, pr introduce our presenters. Um, so Annie Liu is an artist in speculative technology, um, working at the intersection of art and science. Her work explores the impact of technology on culture and identity, uh, imbuing scientific processes with storytelling, narrative, and emotional expression. Her work explores the themes of subconscious, longing, nostalgia, and memory. Exploring in this technologically mediated age, what does it mean to be human? Uh, trained at MIT, she creates research-based art that explores the social and cultural and emotional implications of emerging technologies. Seeking to link technological innovation with emotional tangibility, her work has a, has a range from prosthetics to architecture, augmented reality to synthetic biology. Uh, Annie's work has been presented at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, the Asian Art Museum, MIT Museum, MIT Media Lab, Weissner Gallery, Harvard University, um, as well as media's channels such as Vice, Gizmodo, TED Talks, Fox, and Wired. Um, she has taught at Harvard University Graduate School of Design and has served on numerous design panels, uh, including Dartmouth College, MIT, UPenn, and Harvard. She is on the Committee of Art Scholars at MIT. Uh, Yolandi Gruz, is that, am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Okay. Um, aims to create work that is emotionally stimulating across cultures. Originally from South Africa and practicing in Berlin since 2011, she is formally trained as an architect and with five years of experience developing artworks, installations, and exhibition concepts for Olafur Leyesen. Her work elicits an emotional and often also a memory response in viewers using simple form, formal elements. Her artworks are created as emotional expressions that in turn elicit emotion without semiotics. Instead, formal visual elements such as color and texture, patterns and proportions are employed by the artist and easily read by the viewer. The art making process can be seen as an exploration of the experience of intuition um, and non-meaning, whilst experiencing an emotional response to an aesthetic construct. And last but not least, William Stewart is a PhD student at the Princeton University's Department of German. Uh, before coming to Princeton, he studied uh, for a master's at the um, Freie Universität in Berlin uh, and worked for a number of years as a researcher um, also at Studio Olaf Um So that's, that's one, of the, the, one of the many connections running through um, this panel. Um, so his work focuses on cultural and intellectual um, histories of industrial modernity. His interests orbit the specific culture of capitalism and the changes that culture has undergone in the last century. Uh, he works on the roots of neoliberalism and the social and political conditions of possibility, um, rise of forms of global intelligentsia in the post-war um, post Europe, and the changing paradigms of the real as a barometer for modernism, postmodernism, and perhaps post-postmodernism. And just um, over the break, as a fun tidbit, um, we just received news that William um, just received um, oh, I'm blanking on the name now. Um, Fulbright Scholarship, so congratulations. Um, and so similar to the last panel, I'm going to um, introduce this panel by uh, talking about the work um, of a workshop done by one of the panelists. Um, so um, that is Annie Liu. And um, she came and did a two-day workshop um, in February in um, the VC studio that I'm teaching, the studio um, is entitled um, 
The studio is entitled Containing Elsewhere Cenotaphs for the Burn Books of Babelplatz. Uh, and the um, workshop was dealing with uh, living cenotaphs. So um, drawing upon literary, literary phenomenological and psychoanalytical approaches and illustrated through the figure of the uncanny doppelganger, the design research wrestles with moments of irresolution to show how architecture can carry within its very physical spaces and surfaces the contested nature of identity and therefore must articulate without overcoming the sameness and difference of the ever-changing demographic, spaces, history, and memories. Through the doppelganger, uh, the doppelganger is one instance of the disrupting force of the beta reel, and it is experienced through the perceptive mode and affect of the uncanny, a presence which ought to be absence, a surplus where there should be an absence. It is not the experience of seeing someone who looks like you or someone who looks like they could be your twin, but rather the moment you realize you're seeing that twin, and at the same time, you are both that twin and not that twin and looking at that twin. Uh, the doppelganger is a surplus which should not be there. This creates a uni unique tension where me is you while remaining distinctly me and you. Uh, so in the VC studio, we've been using uh, casting and the notion of the double as a method um, th through thinking, to think through how to remember a difficult past um, specifically, we were looking at the Nazi book burnings, which took place in 1933 in uh, Babelplatz. Um, and uh, so we began the semester by casting concrete forms, um, and they were forms that were meant to just contain. So a cenotaph is a container for a body that lies elsewhere. Um, so we began by in, with intuitive casting and with the only objective that the cast must feel heavy and should contain something. Um, and that's when um, Annie's workshop um, comes into play. So we then took those same forms, um, and in that workshop, and this will make sense when uh, she starts presenting her work, um, we transform those same forms into a living object. Um, so often forms are conceived and created in the vacuum of software and deployed through the precise mechanical arms of machining. The world that these designs are deployed into are never so simple. The living and tropic forces that disobediently mold, there's been a lot of mold, it's been pretty stinky, uh, stain and contaminate are inherent in the fabric of any site. Layering growth, decay, and thereby time into the formal dimension, we, investigate, we investigated the operation of co-creating within different processes. So this exercise, was a launching point into taking account the building as a temporal living entity um, in, as a doppelganger to the monumental immortal casts in concrete, which began the studio. Um, so please welcome Annie Liu. Great, thank you, Linda. Um, so thank you so much for having me here. It's such a pleasure to take the time out to contemplate such matters as the real uh, and how we might brush up against it. So as I give this presentation, I'm going to be showing a smattering of images of my own work and occasionally uh, a scientific diagram or an illustration to make a point. And hopefully you can tell the difference between a stock image and mine, but <laughs> maybe that adds to the soup. So as an artist, I often make work in a laboratory uh, using the tools of science and technology to investigate themes that artists have always investigated. Uh, longing, nostalgia, sexuality, what it means to be human. And I think I'm drawn to working with such technical media because on a cultural and societal level, it's broadly accepted that science provides the foundations for our knowable phenomenal truths. Of course, there are some contested areas like climate change, but for the most part, we look to science and accept notions of reality from scientific evidence, i.e., yes, there is gravity, or oxygen molecules tend to react with hydrogen in this way, uh, etc. But with every technological and scientific development, um, we also get you know, shifts in our plastic subjectivity. 
And many philosophers and theorists have spoken about this idea in different ways over time. The idea that emerging technologies and scientific ideas shift the framework by which we perceive reality. The way we perceive our world is deeply affected by the many elements of our time, our religion, our culture, our economy, our technologies. And today we often look to science and technology to inform us of objective truths, but it often takes a cultural revolution for these discoveries to be accepted. For instance, when early astronomers first began observing the movements of the planets uh, revolving around the sun and not the earth, despite hard evidence, Copernicus was condemned because of the radical way such an observation would challenge the authority of the church. Much later in history, we see similar conflicts over the idea of evolution. And this is because scientific revolutions don't just describe new information. As humans, they often alter our societal norms, our sense of self. Technology does this just as radically, but often times more quietly. We often talk about the way social media alter the way we socialize, or how certain apps shift notions of intimacy, but there are also subtler forces at play, which I find interesting. Our attempts at an objective reality are always colored by our own subjectivity, which are in turn influenced by a whole array of forces. Uh, Thomas Kuhn in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, talk about the rifts in these scientific realities in history. He calls them anomalies, which lead to new paradigms. And I'm particularly interested in this interplay between scientific and technological reality and a cultural reality or even an emotional reality. I'm interested in how all of these forces loop back and forth into each other um, and how art and design can express this. Uh, so for instance, this is a perfume that I made with um, really interesting speculative science to create perfumes that smelled like my grandmother or an ex-lover that I couldn't forget. Um, and these are two helmets that let two people swap vision. Um, I made them back in 2013 and I was really interested in cybernetics and what it means to be a network cyborg and a human machine symbiosis. Relating back to the themes of the conference, the tension between subject and object, the investigation of its relational knowledge, and the paradigm of doubling. And these immediately also brought to my notions of quantum entanglement for me, where pairs of particles cannot be described independent of each other leading them to both exist both discreetly as individuals, but also simultaneously entangled as a disturbable pair with its doppelganger. And that's Linda in the green <laughs> helmet. Um, and so yeah, in fact, one particle cannot even be measured without influencing the other. And I should note that I am not a scientist or a mathematician, but I'm interested in the scientific real and how it influences our construction of cultural reals and vice versa. So another area of study um, that I'm interested in is in the brain and that of the subconscious and emotional processing. While there's a history of separating the rational from the emotional, um, there's both old and new emerging research that shows the importance of emotion in many domains, including reasoning, problem solving, decision making, and perhaps um, I should venture say, to say the pursuit of the real. So one of my projects, um, is called Reflesh. It's an experiment inspired by the somatic, uh, somatic marker hypothesis. It's a phenomena by which your emotional arousal indicates certain realities in your environment before you consciously uh, recognize them in your prefrontal cortex. So um, a famous study for this is the Iowa card game study where you're presented with four decks of cards. Uh, in the study, you get offered money if you get a card higher than a certain one, so you're really motivated to get high cards but you don't know that they're not evenly distributed. Um, like say deck A and C have higher cards. Apparently it takes you about 60 cards to realize this and then you only choose from those decks, but within 10 cards, your palms start to sweat when you reach for a bad deck. So I find this really fascinating. There's something about your emotional intelligence that knows something about what's going on, but you don't consciously know it yet. Um, so together with a friend, we were like, well, no, the body knows this, we can hack this. So we were like, we're gonna just make a little LED bracelet with a galvanic skin response sensor, which measures um, like your stress arousals via your sweaty palms. And every time your palm sweats, whether you know it or not, this LED will light up and then you will know it. And then we ran the study again. And as it turns out, um, 
perhaps some subliminal cues have to be subliminal because once you know that you are stressed out, you tend to get more stressed out and it no longer becomes a meaningful indicator. It was interesting because during the study we had um, people who kind of realized what was going on and then they would like hold it above the decks like some kind of, um, you know, stick for the future. Um, but so it's kind of interesting to me that we tried to illuminate the subconscious um, and in some ways it backfired. But the fact that these kind of indicators exist is very interesting. Um, let's see my notes. So yeah, to give the person access to his or her affective real, to test if gaining that access could significantly change behavior. Um, so then all of these kind of cognitive studies led to another project. So I read all these scientific papers on emotional cognition and started to wonder, is it possible to bypass um, the artifact of aesthetics and art making and just program emotions directly into your brain through your body through science? So together with a group of um, scientists and engineers and friends, we imagined this thing we called the affective induction spa um, and we called it the future of art where we use findings from science to induce emotional experiences, um, specifically happiness and euphoria. So for instance, studies show that really small bodily changes, like holding a pencil in your mouth, can improve your mood because it activates your zygomatic muscles, um, the same ones as smiling. Or those who take a placebo pill are more likely to believe that their symptoms are alleviated even when they know it's a placebo. So we were in the Museum of Fine Arts and we had all these studies gathered and so we like literally fed participants placebo pills. Um, we gave them devices designed to make them smile. We flashed uh, specific light wavelengths correlated with euphoria and read a list of 50 most positively affectively rated words at them. <laughs> and then we um, flooded their uh, social media accounts with likes while electrocuting their hands into a thumbs up sign. <laughs> and so, you know, like, it's playful and absurd, but part of it is kind of asking questions like, how much do we want to be quantified selves? How reducible are we to flesh and neurons to measurements? This is a performance piece in which neuroscience and art converge to question thresholds between the mind, body, aesthetics, and emotional experiences. Um, and this is the last project. Another project of mine tries to reveal a hidden component of the reality of our landscape. It's called Mind in the Machine. It's a textile that was digitally manufactured and programmed to stitch uh, the reflection of a factory worker's state of mind. Um, so I had the pleasure of going, or um, I guess just the interesting condition of uh, going to a factory in China and working there for a month. Uh, and it happened to be a knitting factory. And it made me think a lot about knitting, first of all, um, that knitting has a long tradition of not just being functional, but also in expressing many aspects of being human. Historically, culturally, emotionally, it's imbued with traditions. It, unlike machines, humans have unique quirks and tendencies. So, um, you know, like maybe you tend to daydream a lot and you tend to slip a lot of stitches or like maybe you're tense and all of your knits end up super tight. Um, knitting involves all these complex protocols and carries the unique signature of the maker. But, you know, with the proliferation of automation in factories, mass-produced knits have a very standardized stitch that remove that mark. And, of course, automation has many functions and plays critical roles in our technological advancement, but I couldn't help but wonder, is it possible to imbue automation with something as intimate as the mark of a brushstroke? As a work of art, it tries to reinsert the emotional mark of the maker back into the machine. So this project takes the cognitive quirks of a human via their EEG data and translates them into the knitting process. So took the EEG data of a worker in a factory, um, and then I learned how to program the knitting machine, which happens to be a very visual language. Um, in those squares below, each one of those colors indicates a kind of stitch, like top to bottom or like bottom to top or like double tied knot or something like that. Um, and then that EEG data will be transferred into the knit. So literally when the worker is more tense, the fabric is tenser and when they're more relaxed, it's more relaxed. Um, and a typical day in the factory involves a lot of human attention tending to the machine, fixing broken needles, threading the yarn feeder, smoothing out errant stitches. The days are really long and monotonous and often the products and the labor are anonymous. 
Uh, when people look at their clothes and shoes, they often take for granted that any human hands ever touched them in the making. So this project tries to stitch together a portrait of the factory worker through their fluctuating moods through the day, capturing moments of frustration, focus, and meditative flow. And the resulting fabric tells a story, each one unique to the worker in that particular moment in time. Um, and you know, there are many ways that humans express themselves through music, art, fashion. What does this expression look like in the age of mechanical production? Is there a way to insert the mark of being human back into the mechanical process? Um, and those were some of the questions. So given much, that much of the discourse around finding the real involves questioning whether we have access to it at all, I am interested in studies in cognitive science where both knowledge is inserted and retrieved subconsciously, i.e., can we know things that we don't know that we know just through lucid thought? And can our brains and bodies hold more knowledge than we can access, and how do we access them? Again, I'm not an expert, but these are some launching points to um, the soup of ideas that we're cooking. So thank you. Okay, great. Now you can hear me. So I just want to say thank you so much for the invitation from Linda and Dean Speaks. It's really nice to be here and to be in front of such a curious audience. Um, I'd like to start with um, this quote by the late Leonard Cohen. And I'd like to invite you just to close your eyes and to listen if you feel comfortable with that. Or you can read along. So my mind seems to go out on a path the width of a thread and of endless length a thread that is the same color as the night. Out, out along the narrow highway sails my mind, driven by curiosity, luminous with acceptance, far and out like a feathered hook, whipped deep into the light above the stream by magnificent cast. Somewhere, out of my reach, my control, the hook unbends into a spear. The spear shears itself into a needle, and the needle sews the wool together. It sews skin onto the skeleton and lipstick on a lip, it sows, sows Edith to her grease paint crouching for as long as I, this book, or an eternal I remembers in our lightless sub-basement. It sows scarves to mountain. It goes through everything like a relentless bloodstream, and the tunnel is filled with a comforting message, a beautiful knowledge of unity. All the disparates of the world, the different wings of the paradox, coin faces of problem, petal pulling questions, scissors shaped conscience, all the polarities, things and their images, and things which cast no shadow, and just the everyday explosions on the street, this face and that, a house and a toothache, explosions which merely have different letters in their names. My needle pierces it all, and I myself, my greedy fantasies, everything which has existed and does exist, we are part of a necklace of incomparable beauty and unmeaning. This compelling text by the late um, Leonard Cohen describes thread as it transforms and goes on to become part of the world. I find thread fascinating because it transcends dimensions. It's at once two and three dimensional. It is simple, yet it holds extreme uh, potential. Physically, ideologically, it weaves a web of meaning. Thread or twine or twisted plant fibers have been with us as long as we have been human. Thread is a metaphor for development, complexity, time, connection, relationships, and more literally, it forms the clothing that we wear. And this clothing in the textile industry, which Annie also just referred to, um, 
the industry which has brought it to, uh, to us serve as a reflection of the times we are living in and the state that this world is in. In my work, I naturally tend to explore and to expose the nature of thread and its ability to make connections, create surfaces, and delineate space. What is it about lines that is so fascinating? I think this question is really so rich in meaning. Further, what is it about raw materials that is so fascinating? It's the nature of lines and raw materials to hold potential. I'm drawn to spools of thread as raw materials waiting to be unraveled and, to and used to create space or meaning. We can use thread to investigate the in-between space and time. What's not there? What can be outlined, but isn't? Seeing a line of thread is like seeing a time sequence all at once. My explorations of thread lead to creations of objects that are clearly aesthetic and exemplify non-meaning. Yet they remind us of a sophisticated industry on which our society relies. The weaving industry is real, yet for the most part it's not seen, and as such not really thought about. Each piece starts with an idea. Ideas are products of our entire being, our ancestry included. An idea can never truly be translated. Ideas live in a part of our minds somewhere between the subconscious and the conscious. The materialization of an idea calls for the translation of that idea from nothing to something, from energy to materials, from finites, infinites to finites. In this process, the idea is both caught and lost. And in fact, in its place, a new idea is born. Production is always an experiment. And that's what's so fascinating about creation. We have to try to see what happens and to find out. How we imagine things is not real. It's this birthing process, as Irene so aptly calls it, that really creates the idea, at least the physical idea. The ether idea stays pure where we left it. So these are just some production images. Um, as long as I can remember, I've been fascinated by textiles, but the impetus to explore the dimensionality of weaving started in a carpet factory in Harry Smith, my home country of South Africa, a year ago. Oh, just the, oh these are some more um, interpretations of the, the previous idea. Okay, so these are the photos of the factory. And I don't think anything I can do can live up to this factory. It's really quite incredible to see. And it's equally incredible to imagine how many other su um, such systems are in play in our world, creating our reality. So the, the beauty of the thread in this factory is really plain to see. And um, after my visit, I was very inspired and um, really wanted to translate this into some sort of artwork. But of course, I had a lot of questions. So questions like, um, how do I frame the piece? How are the strings suspended? What materials make sense? How large should it be? Um, so I decided to make the piece as large as possible in the small Berlin project space where it was um, to be set up. Um, and to make the frame white so that it was kind of hidden and that you didn't notice it. The pins were spaced according to what the staple gun allowed. And um, this is the finished piece. And here you can see the pins at the top. And underneath you can see a second row of pins. So there were two sheets, two sheets of thread. And the back sheet was um, very dense and the front sheet was very spaced out. So when you walk past it made a moiré effect. Um, the piece itself required three kilometers of thread and we used cotton because it's, it had to be recycled afterwards. So, of course, the cotton loves to knot, so it was also very tricky to install. And here you can see um, one image is only of the one set of strings and the second image, there's a see-through second set of strings. Okay. So sometimes the materials inspire the work. The top wall of spring is by string or thread, actually wool, is by a Berlin-based fashion brand. Um, it's like a high-end luxury brand called Lala Berlin. And um, this material really inspired the work. Uh, this is the piece. It's supposed to be subversive. There's 
a very thin brass thread just pulling the, th the strings up. So it's very plain. And sometimes reading inspires my work. I'm sure you're all familiar with um, Donna Haraway's string figures and Bruno Latour's actor network theory. And here you can see this piece is just in tension. It's a piece of wood at the top and at the bottom there's an acetate rod. It's sus being suspended. And if you forget that it's in suspension, it just falls. Okay. And then I work a lot with models just to check how things are when they're not no longer in my mind. Um, and this um, actually developed into a work that I made for a restaurant in Berlin, which used to be an old pharmacy. So here the piece is just a working model. And um, this piece was really taken directly from the materials of the restaurant. So it's a very old space. Um, I used wood and brass and um, it was quite a process to create the piece. And the strings are leather. So, and I think it's 200 meters of string. This is the restaurant, and there's the piece. And it's really, it's, it was very interesting in the sense that um, I had a very clear vision of what I wanted to do before. Um, but when the piece was finished, it was really a very peculiar object and really strange. Um, but it fits well in the space and, and, um, yeah, it's, it's got a, a character of its own. And I'd just like to go cl um, close by going back to the title of this panel by s and by saying that creating objects in whatever form is really exactly about the process of inventing non-fictions and in doing so it's disrupting sensibilities. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, first of all, um, Linda, thank you so much. And uh, Dean Speaks, thank you so much for the invitation to having us here. It's been a really wonderful weekend. Um, I'm going to just jump into um, the, some thoughts about the title of the, uh, of the actual symposium, the beta reel, and go through what I think of are potentially three paradigms of what this means, because I don't think it's actually very obvious what beta reel is about, even though we've all talked about it today. So um, there we go. Um, and because my time is limited, I'm going to put my cards on the table right away and say that, um, as I understand it, all right. <laughs> Let's see. This is a high level one. Right. Did you guys know that there were lights in this building? Here's the thing. The room has been lit the whole time. You just didn't know. I think it'll be okay if we just get back to where we were originally. I think if we can just get all those. Okay. It'll get brighter, I promise. Okay, let's just go, let's just go, keep going. Um, so as I understand it, the beta reel um, gestures to a mode of thought, or better, an operation that seeks to conceive of the real or reality as contingent, multiple, and artificial, and thereby manageable, manipulable, and usable. So I'm going to present three potential paradigms of such beta reel thought. That is, the ubiquity of weird excess, the legitimacy of real frauds, and the politics of speculative mediation. A lot of jargon, so let's unpack some of this. What do I, what do I mean? What do I mean with weird excess? Let's we'll start there. So I would like to suggest that our discussion of the beta reel might be a discussion of a kind of schizophrenic thought. 
And we can approach this very naively, um, bracketing the well-worn discourse of Gilles Deleuze and Félix Gattari, which is interesting, but not what I'm interested in today. Um, the psychologist and developer of the eponymous inkblot test, Hermann Rorschach, um, for instance, distinguished schizophrenic thought as dissociated, illogical, fluid, and circumstantial, not a particularly surprising chain of descriptors for the present day. But in its dissociative fluidity, schizophrenic logic is marked by a particular creative ethos, too. Chris Krauss tracks this in her novel, I Love Dick. Maybe you guys have seen the television adaptation of this that just came out, where she describes the schizophrenic experience as being, quote, permanently stoned on a drug that combines the visual effects of LSD with heroin's omnipotence, lucidity. Indeed, this lucidity is what allows schizophrenic thought to exhibit a supreme flexibility. Everything makes a kind of sense. Krauss writes that, quote, schizophrenia reveals content, that is, patterns of association, like in a Borges world, where one moment can unfold into a universe. Significantly for our context, Krauss goes on to describe scholarship and research as forms of schizophrenia as well. In its insistence on lucidity, Krauss writes, Schizophrenic thought drives our raids on an incomprehensible, ineffable real. She says, if reality is unbearable and you don't want to give up, you have to understand the patterns. Schizophrenia characterizes our search for proof, says Krauss. It's an orgy of coincidences. But lucidity, it turns out, reveals weirdness. As Krauss continues, the schizophrenic operates with a kind of paleologic, an insistence that A can be both A and not A simultaneously. Contemporary philosopher Timothy Morton uses this formula to conceive of objects' weirdness. He's used, this is his term. Um, their withdrawnness from us, what he calls an object's magical rift between metaphysical essence and phenomenological appearance. Inasmuch as it remains suspended between its essence and its appearance, an object violates the principle of non-contradiction by existing by its, uh, as itself and not itself as something in addition to something not merely itself, that is, P and not P. So an example would be my water bottle. So you say the essence of the water bottle is a thing that holds the water. Cool. But my water bottle is also gray. My water bottle is also hard. But gray is not my water bottle. If you say, what's gray? And I, so I hold this up, you're like, well, that's a water bottle. And I say, what's hard? And you're like, well, hard is that. No, hard is something different. It's a quality. But the water bottle is hard, and it is gray, and it does hold water. And so Morton wants to say between these two, that's not actually something that needs to be resolved. We can say that it is both an example of hardness at the same time that it is a thing that holds water. And so that would be his notion of um, metaphysical essence on the one hand and phenomenological appearance on the other, P and not P. So Morton says that this is characteristic of how we encounter real things. They are akin to the paradoxical statement, this sentence is false. The sentence exists in a, si a state of simultaneous truth and falsehood, P and not P. If the sentence is false, is true, then the sentence is false. But if the sentence states that it is false and it is false, then it must be true, et cetera, et cetera, ad infinitum. I'm sure you guys in Philosophy 101 dealt with this, right? But it's weird, but it works somehow. So whether as an orgy of coincidences or a surplus logic in a thing's being both itself and something more than itself, weirdness implies excess. Weirdness defines a situation in which more is present than can be accounted for in which explanations cannot exhaust the experience. When we interrogate something weird, we encounter something whose significance or meaning is in excess of us. We want to understand what the weird has that we don't and why. So I wish to connect these two ideas and say that a schizophrenic logic allows for the weird excess of P not P in the way that we perceive reality, but also that as Krauss, what Krauss calls the drive for lucidity results from such an encounter with a reality of excess and works to diminish its weirdness. It's a kind of perpetuating paranoid gesture, what Morton calls the schizophrenic defense, the belief that there are causal chains operating behind my back, something weirdly in excess of what I can observe at any given moment. In the interest of lucidity, the schizophrenic logic posits a pattern or narrative against this weird and overpowering background and then insists on the priority of that narrative's realness. So what am I talking about? Let's go to number two, real frauds. Let's look at an example. Halfway through Ben Lerner's 2015 novel, there we go, 1004, which I recommend, by the way, a very nice book, a narrator, because one has the sense that there may indeed be more than one, sits at a lavish dinner explaining a new novel to a successful author sitting across from him. 
He tells her about a storyline he knows he will include, one he has recently heard from the stepfather of a close friend. Here's the story. A college couple are in love, and the female partner, Ashley, finds out that she has cancer. Her male partner vows to take care of her. She begins chemo. She refuses to let him into the hospital with her, though. She loses her hair. She drops weight. And then one night, a year in, they're watching a movie in bed, and Ashley rolls over and says she doesn't have cancer. She's been faking it. She pulled her hair out. She purges her meals. She has no appetite. She sits in the bathroom stall at the hospital when she pretends to get treatment. The male partner asks why. She had felt alone, she says, confused, like something was wrong with her. It had gotten out of hand. The narrator here speaks Ashley's lines, hence the double quotes. The lie described my life better than the truth until it became a kind of truth. The successful author looks at the narrator as if trying to discern if this anecdote might be lifted from his life, and then says that he should definitely include it in the novel. So what's going on here? A narrator, considering whether or not to include it in his next novel, which we suspect may actually be the novel we are reading, tells a story he heard from someone's stepfather about a woman telling a story concerning her mortality to her partner. A narrative, Cancer Lie, is the subject of a frame narrative told to the narrator, recounted in another narrative, whose status as, as frame thereby becomes obvious. Um, it's a satisfying tour de force of literary technique, but even as a textual Russian doll, it's not particularly groundbreaking. Um, there's a nice weirdness, perhaps, to the question um, about whether or not this story, namely the cancer lie, is actually in the novel by being explained by the, uh, to the author. Um, it is there, but it's there only as description, as metadata. So maybe it also isn't in the novel, P and not P. And I me messed around with some different ways. I think because the story of the cancer lie in some way belongs to that of the narrator, we might think of this as, um, once again, this double mirror effect, or perhaps something like this, where we have a sort of fading out of the, of the cancer lie back into the realm of the, of the true narration. Not really sure. Um, OK, but then, 100 pages later, a narrator encounters the stepfather of a close friend remembering his former girlfriend, Ashley, confessing to him that she's faking her cancer. Only now, the stepfather is married to a woman, Emma, who indeed is dying of cancer. He imagines Emma doing the same thing, admitting to him that she is faking it. If he found out it was a hoax, he says, he wouldn't be relieved. If she told him that she was not actually dying, he wouldn't be relieved. He'd trash the house and leave Emma. He says, quote, if I were to learn she was faking her death, she'd be dead to me. For the stepfather, the realness of Emma's death is absolute. She's either truly dying or if she is faking it, he will blot her out from his life, rendering her, in effect, dead. In the case of Emma, the hoax death is as real as the biological death. And then the stepfather muses about Ashley, his former girlfriend, wondering if she, in fact, hadn't been faking it, but had only said she had been faking it in order to relieve him of the burden of, physically, of, uh, of watching her physically die. Here, too, the lie becomes realer death than the death itself. The actual diagnosis is secondary, perhaps even immaterial, to the immediacy of the narrative that Ashley has cancer and to the double immediacy of the narrative revealed as narrative in the admission that she has been lying about it. So unlike the frame narratives that one might associate with paradigms of so-called postmodern literature, Italo Calvino, Paul Auster, Julio Cortazar, just to name three examples, in which the frame becomes the site of fiction against which an elusive real is contrasted, in these passages from 1004, I want to argue, the frame, the narrative, assumes priority as the most real element. It is multiple, contingent, but it's also what matters most. Against an absolute and overpowering background of causal chains embodied here in the cancer diagnosis, we find the narratives about the diagnosis and about fidelity between lovers to be most real. Drives for lucidity, whether Ashley's sense of something being wrong with her or the stepfather's insistence on Ashley's diagnosis, deliver us back to the weird, to an awareness of the ways that certain realities are excessive or too much to handle, whether on account of death or dishonesty. The lie describes better than the truth, thereby becoming a kind of truth. The lie is a marker for the real. I think this paradigm is not limited to Lerner's novel and indeed can be historicized. You don't have to look far to spot this logic of truthful lies and real frauds at key points in political discourse after the uh, September 11th attacks. In a now famous 2004 piece for the New York Times, Ron Suskin describes a 2002 interview with a person identified only as a senior advisor to Bush, that's Bush number two,
who articulated something that got to the very heart of the Bush presidency. He says, guys like you are living in what we call the reality-based community. You believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. That's not the way the world works anymore. We're an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality, judiciously as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too, and that's how things will sort out. We're history's actors, and you, all of you, will be left to just study what we do. The quotation has been attributed to then White House De Deputy Chief of Staff Karl Rove, although Rove has since denied ever saying it. And while such a statement from the White House, no less, certainly fuels a certain kind of deep state conspiracy thinking, it reveals much about what we might name the political ethos of the beta real. Essentially, two forms of reality are, are in competition in this description. First, the discernible one of those occupying what they foolishly believe to be a reality-based community, and second, the political real of the Bush-era American empire, dependent on a kind of Hegelian historicism in which individual actors, like Mr. Rove perhaps, speculating, placed in positions of extreme historical and political leverage determine what will and will not be counted as real. The American invasion of Iraq over the purported existence of weapons of mass destruction, concurrent to the interview in which that was spoken, provides such an obvious example uh, of this sort of dynamic that it hardly warrants further ex explication. But as a case study for the conceit of Rove's empire reality, Richard Grusin has ordered the second Iraq war within the framework of a distinctly post 9-11 phenomenon that he names pre-mediation, homing in on the very literal sense in which the conflict was pre-mediated within neoconservative dossiers and official US defense strategies. Grusin traces the phenomenon of pre-mediation to the aftershocks of the World Trade Center attacks. He says pre-mediation characterizes the mediality of the first decade of the 21st century as focused on the cultural desire to make sure that the future has always been, already been pre-mediated before it turns into the present or the past, in large part to try to prevent the media, and hence the American public, from being caught unawares as it was on the morning of 11 September 2001. Pre-mediation attempts to imagine and propagate through mainstream media various scenarios of trauma in advance, so that when one of the given traumas occurs, the public will be better able to cope with it. While Rove's position is marked by a chilling fatalism about the determining power, the reality effect, of his political actions, Grusin suggests that pre-mediating moves may not be about predicting or prophesying the future per se. Rather, they attempt to put into play as many plausible anticipatory presents as can be sustained in the hopes that individually or collectively, these anticipatory logics will allow us to experience the future with expectation, ennui, boredom, or even mild deja vu. Premediation, he says, is not about getting the future right, but about proliferating multiple remediations of the future, both to maintain a low level of fear in the present and to prevent a recurrence of the kind of tremendous media shock that the United States and much of the network world experienced on 9-11. Motivated by fear in the face of all excess of possible future traumas, the pre-mediative tendency recalls Krauss's schizophrenic drive for lucidity, in which the real is mitigated through the weird excess of an obsessive mechanism of prognostication. Indeed, literary theorist, theorist Christy Wampole has recently identified in the New York Times in an op-ed a particularly ubiquitous form of pre-mediatic anticipation in our contemporary moment, what she calls speculative journalism. This is the kind of news story with a clickbait inflected question in the headline where reporters don't report, but rather make guesses about what might happen in the future. The headlines, Wan Paul writes, prepare us for a future catastrophe by, referring, by rehearsing it in advance. So a schizophrenic drive reveals itself in this obsessive prognostication, one that constantly churns out speculative patterns of association and ever new possible configurations of content. There is a lucidity undergirding this kind of speculative mediation, but it is one of hypotheticals. The P and not P logic reveals its particular force here when one considers the very real effects that these kinds of speculations have on the economy and political policy, despite their being purely virtual. The polling in advance of the 2016 presidential election springs to mind here as a clear example. But this is nothing less than the symptom of a schizophrenic defense against the causal excess going on in the background, the background out of which ever new catastrophes will emerge but also the background out of which, so the schizophrenic optimism holds, some messianic moment might also arrive. Perhaps it is on this wager that the terms of the schizophrenic beta reel are accepted. If the speculative lie can describe life better than the truth until it becomes a kind of truth, then there is hope that our most utopian desires might one day become real 
if we insist on them long enough. So this is the situation that I've tried to map out. Sorry, that's very faint. Um, of incessant premediation, of comfortability with weird excesses of P, not P states of superposition, of belief in the efficacy of our narratives, no matter how artificial we know them to be. And I'm struck by the affinity of such a conceit with both a literary uh, poetics and our current political profile. If it indeed manifests in these paradigms, I have the sense that the beta reel reflects what Czech German media theorist Willem Flusser observes as the programmatic structure, that is, as program, fundamental to our reality. For Flusser, social problems deal not with the forces or the purposes of the political body, but rather the strategies at play in a massive game. We judge reality based on function and produced effect, something that the German already applies, Wirkung, Effect, Wirken to Effect, Die Wirklichkeit, Reality. Games, says Flusser, are our ontological ground, and all future ontology is necessarily game theory. Everything is fiction, nothing is real. Or perhaps to reformulate the claim, nothing is real that isn't a fiction. The jury is still out on whether this bodes well or ill for us. It could be that the beta real is the precondition for our variability to be productive at all. Hans Blumenberg observed it as much in 1956. That what is not is equally real as what is, is the precise expression for possibility of the modern will to create generally, for the terra incognita whose untrammeled states state invites imaginations. We treat reality like a program, like something programmable, in the hopes that we might be better able to control it, might better create with it. And in doing so, we trade one weirdness for another, the weirdness of the excessively incomprehensible for the weirdness of the artificially manageable. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you so much for these wonderful presentations. Um, we're gonna take an, another break now. Um, so we'll reconvene at 4.35. Um, and for actually the part I am most excited about, uh, which is the roundtable discussion to finally get all of these amazing speakers into a dialogue. So um, we'll see you soon. Yes. So we've, we were debating how we should sit and I decided that they should sit in, in the order that we presented. What kind of reality that produces, we will find out soon. <laughs> um, so um, we've now reached the roundtable discussion, which is going to be moderated by Irene. Um, and so she has selected uh, a few images and has some questions to start us off. Right. So I guess I'd like to start by going back to one of Linda's points, that categorical distinctions are fictional constructions. And um, we are a big group. We broadly can identify as thinkers and makers. Uh, but we don't want to set up any sort of dichotomy between the two. And um, I think it's always helpful to have sort of some disciplinary ground to stand on to um, to start from, but I don't think I, any of us are um, happy to singularly define ourselves as a historian or artist or a philosopher. I think, especially now that we're sitting together, um, we can address how we think through many forms of media. So um, I guess to start, I'd like everybody to give a little bit of, of their uh, reaction to that, the way we grouped you in these panels and the way we titled the talks. Um, just as a reminder, the first three we called destabilizing sites in between, and then the second group, inventing nonfiction, disrupting sensibilities. So maybe <coughs> Should we start in order? <laughs> as we've forced, you, <laughs> we've forced you into these groups, and we're asking you about how you feel about being in them, and so now we'll make you also be in order in them. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I thought, thought this was curated in, incredibly well. Um, it, was, it was interesting to, to see how things can be destabilized, whether it's the question of um, something as innocuous as a road opening up onto protest or peace or, or you know, joy and suffering or um, the reality of clouds. Uh, I had never thought about clouds that way. You know, and, and, and had, you know, of course, yeah, 
Brian and I, I had this weird uh, doppelganger moment with Brian uh, where you didn't, might not have caught it, but it talked about, you know, how chairs fall apart. And when they do, you know, Heidegger's like, oh, this is a moment. And so to hear, you know, Brian sort of articulate that in his own way and then also to hear me introduce Sarah Ahmed and then he turn around and do the same thing. There are just these moments of, um, there are just these moments of, of synchronicity that we're incredibly destabilizing at the same time. And so, I, I mean, I, all I can speak for is, yeah, it was incredibly curated. Like, you, yeah, you did this, you did this thing. Um, yes, I completely agree. Um, you did a really wonderful job. It was a real pleasure also seeing it all together and then you kind of recognize your own role differently. Um, I think in our panel, I really liked that um, there were quite a few different ways of speaking about infrastructure and also the idea of the metaphor. You used the road as a metaphor, I used the cloud as a metaphor and as a real thing. Like, And I think it also kind of worked pretty well amongst the three of us, um, which made me feel good because often like working in a kind of metaphor-based way can be a bit tricky. Um, also, I think it's important that we in an architecture school talk about infrastructure because I really think there's, that's um, a speciality that we as architects should be thinking about, like kind of how we can move away from the object towards this kind of more logistical infrastructural space. Yeah, uh, well obviously, I thought it was great too. Um, <laughs> That sounded patronizing. I'm sorry. I, I, it was really, it was wonderful. Um, I, I don't know if I have like really specific connections yet. You know, I was thinking as we're talking, uh, uh, as Biko and Natalie were talking about this kind of relationship, the relationship of the tool and the broken tool is something you use in the moment when you notice that thing. And I'm interested in that the idea that, that either an artistic practice or even, even the practice of removing something and putting it on display, that the other ways of simulating what Heidegger was describing as a broken tool or other ways of creating that experience. I, I mean, I, I think you could go to, for example, go to a plantation uh, museum and experience it and not feel anything is broken, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you're not prepared in the right way. So I, I'm, and I don't know if it's, I think the Whitney is disarming uh, when you visit it in the sense that you're prepared for it because it's quite often not, it's never someone in a hoop skirt leading you around, but it's quite often a, a younger uh, black person that had grown up close to that plantation uh, that lives in the neighborhood, that their families are tied to it in some way, that that the, it's not a breaking of the, the plantation system. It's not something that's broken, but it's a way of putting something in your face that you kind of assume uh, that when it works, you just don't notice it. So, so I'm, I'm interested in, I, I don't know if the same idea of trying to find a way to envision the infrastructure that makes the, the cloud possible is related or not, but I'm interested in the fact that it's, it's not just going out and, and making something fail, it's about making the way something works all of a sudden apparent to you as a thing that's working. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah, I almost, I almost, like part of what I was thinking about is something I wrote a paper, grad school guys, it was a long time ago, and I uh, wrote a paper on, and essentially asked the question, using the slave as a, as a model, like what happens when the, when the hammer breaks down, right? And the slave is this perfect space where the hammer breaks down, mm -hmm. right? And I'm just, I, I don't know how to think about that in relation, but I was, as you were talking, and I, you, know, you have these slave quarters that are right next to the swamp, and these tools keep running off, right? They keep getting lost, right? They keep in or, you know, in certain cases they punch back with, you know, Frederick Douglass and Edward Covey. There's a particular way in which I'm interested in the slave as this object that is refusing to recede, right? And and I don't know what to do with that, but it is incredibly destabilizing precisely because you don't your MacBook doesn't say, you know, kiss my ass, right? It it it, it does what it needs to do in a way that a slave is like, nah, like I'm feeling this and I don't wanna, 
You know, so there's something about that refusal of the object as an object that, that destabilizes our subject-object realities. So I guess moving on to um, the second panel. I mean, I really loved the way you put us together and especially this phrase, inventing non-fictions, right? Like I think a lot of my work has to do with speculative design and design fictions and speculative realisms. Um, I think that amongst anthropologists and psychologists, there's always this argument like what makes humans unique animals? And one of them that I've heard is that humans are the only animals that tell themselves stories. Um, and in many ways, we are the stories we tell ourselves. And then to hear William talk about the um, moments where lies are more real <laughs> than the truth or the way Yolanda goes and perceives these, in, I don't know, like these intense phenomenal experiences in the factory and then translates them into these other kinds of experiences that are capturing its, like some aspect of its emotional truth. I, you know, I think that it was a really interesting rounding out of this fiction, nonfiction, and storytelling, I guess, yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, I really enjoyed being on this um, panel, or in my group. Um, I think what's really interesting is that when uh, Linda asked me to take part in this, I was really at the beginning stage of leaving architecture and entering the art world. So I'm very much still a beta artist in that sense. Um, and this whole experience was very much, um, yeah, kind of giving me a narrative also and forcing me to think very hard about what it means to, to create fictions or to create non-fictions. Um, yeah. And then, Um, I think I'm struck mostly by the maybe what we might call inadvertent uh, resonance between so many of the of the, the projects. So I mean, you began everybody by talking about the way that categorical divisions are artificial or fictional, and that may be the case. And like the, the two panel topics might be divi um, you know artificial divisions, but there were so many organic um, interactions that obviously you guys helped and shaped this together in your curation of this. But there's some things you couldn't have planned for just in terms of thematic overlap. Um, object lessons that people pulled out. And I think what that, what that tells me, um, Brian, you talked about home. You talked about home with Heidegger. And Biko, I think you also had an, ish, an interest in home. And I was just going to say, um, maybe to open it out to the room, too, that architecture as a discipline um, is really inspiring for me because it's a home for so many different diverse kinds of thinking. And it, it activates and deploys so many different kinds of thinking. That's, it's not just about you know, building houses. You guys know all this, but I think for people outside of architecture, that's a lesson that is um, worth learning and worth, worth remembering. Um, because in a certain way, the, the panel is home to so many, you know, various and myriad ideas, which is, you know, it goes back actually to the notion of the discipline itself being a kind of disciplinary structure, um, but also a kind of arbitrary division that nevertheless opens out and in, in, in sort of unfolds so many other um, so many other disciplines that are opposed to it or, or, or that are anti to it, or that one might think um, on the surface or, or don't belong to architecture. Great. Should we switch to the next slide? Um, so my s the second point would be um, this idea that uh, our aim that Linda raised of critiquing systems of power, production, and infrastructure. And actually this relates a little bit to the the talk that William you gave to a few of uh, Linda's students um, yesterday about the grid, suggesting maybe a reshuffling of these two groups of three, um, we read into um, your work uh, maybe a few pairings of uh, sets of systems that are shared. So perhaps um, I'll, I'll run through them now and then we can kind of uh, have these new pairs respond to uh, these suggested systems. So Yolanda and Natalie, I think we found um, themes of language and meaning in your work. Um, and then Annie and William, the idea of um, aesthetic value in literature and in speculative design. And then for Biko and Brian, um, maybe it's 
obvious uh, bodies and labor. So um, how do we begin to critique systems of power production infrastructure through these pairings? So Yolandi and Natalie, maybe you can start as I'm borrowing your image, this stunning image from the factory. <laughs> okay, well, um, I think it's fair to say that language in itself is a tool that has a huge influence on the way that we express ourselves and the things that we're able to say. So I think that's something that Wittgenstein said. Um, and it's also a system that's, that can be manipulated by learning different languages. So for instance, I'm in Germany at the moment, so I've learned German and um, also like William demonstrated with Wirklichkeit. It plays a huge role in helping us to visualize ideas. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, so I looked into, I was curious and I looked into the idea of the word cloud computing and um, so apparently Dell tried to trademark the term in 2008 and so just appropriating a word and using it for for marketing purposes, I think it's super interesting. And um, cloud computing as a term entered the Oxford English Dictionary only in 2012, and so six years later we take it for granted, but I think it's really interesting when it comes to emerging technologies and how we name. Yeah, um, exactly, I mean, the fact that we call that we, that we say we upload it to the cloud rather than that we save it in a data center. Um, just uh, this kind of phrasing is really interesting. And it, I mean, cloud computing relates to the fact that it's, it's remote computing. So there's this uh, interesting thing, kind of very non-Heideggerian happening between like, um, yeah, remoteness and kind of these unknown location, inaccessible sites, changing sites, um, the um, uh, discrepancy between the sites of production and the sites of archiving. And um, yeah, this, with this term cloud, <laughs> you can just kind of continue forever because like there's uh, so much, um, suggested by it and, and the way cloud also through the course of history, I mean, for example, in religious theaters in the um, Quattrocento, like in the 15th century in, um, in Florence, they built these cloud props that would be mediators between kind of the earth on stage and heaven. So again, like cloud, the cloud was kind of used as this mediating tool between a here and a somewhere else, like an inaccessible space. And in terms of how Yolandi and I relate, I think um, this image is really nice because it has a kind of cloudiness. It's like about densities. It's also about materiality. It's about these um, it visualizes an industry, it visualizes a production process, it also visualizes a material, I guess it's cotton, right? Uh, what? Wool. Wool. So actually what we see here is also um, the sheep that had to be um, shared and raised. And so there's like, if you start looking at things in terms of clouds, like, as something that visualizes a, a vast amount of processes and information, you, it, I think it's like quite a rich term, basically. And I just add to that, it's actually um, that wool is also obviously a material of memory. Mm -hmm. Something that Natalie deals with a lot is that um, wool, like hair or like your nails, it's something that contains memory inside of it. And we can relate that directly back to the, to the internet or to a World Wide Web. So here we have the rule as the, yes. Like the archival the quality. Yes, yeah, the archival material, but we can also have that in the digital format. Okay. So then Annie and William. Also, we, William, you talked a bit about um, the um, 
the MFA and the, the legalization mm -hmm. of like legal real in the, in the art world, and I found that that um, that linked to you and Annie's uh, project of the um, <coughs> affect induction spa a little bit about how you read cultural value and in aesthetic experiences. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can react a little bit to Annie's point. You want the first um, well, I had some thoughts when you first brought this up, but I'm not sure if this is exactly what you were thinking. Because um, the two words I wrote down were um, aesthetics and language. And I think perhaps it's almost too obvious the kind of intersection between um, my interest in like science and technology and art all, like, all often lands in perception. So for a while I was really interested in whether there was kind of a universality in the semiotics of aesthetics, for instance. Like, um, for instance, we are very social animals, so we're very prone to finding faces in things. If you design a chair or something and place the handles in specific ways, always going to see a face. Or like your amygdala will almost always light up if you see the top eye whites of someone else's eyes, because like evolutionarily that means like oh my god, there was probably something really horrifying happening in the line of sight of that person who went like this. Um, and now, of course, we are always inundated with so much data and um, the kind of aesthetic packaging of big data is like such a huge, um, I guess, problem. Like, you know, <laughs> when I'm not like making art because that's all I want to do in life, I have to take a lot of freelance work and it's often data visualization. <laughs> Um, so for me, that's also a really interesting project because it means that some amount of invisible information in this world has been accumulated into bits or numbers and now I have to recalibrate it back into the phenomenal world as an image or a sensory perception or something like that. Um, so, I don't know. Um, for me, it's always entangled that um, the visual and the semantic and the semiotic, like how do you express the kind of abstract things that William is saying in his um, talk through aesthetics? Like how, how would I ever do that? Can I com communicate something to you as complex as that without words um, is something that I'm super interested in. Yeah, I'll try to then span your comments, Annie, and, and Irene, your um, um, provocation, I guess. Um, so that this combination of aesthetics and value, um, the way that uh, a value, it can be aesthetic or a, an aesthetic can be evaluated or given a value, um, that obviously calls into question immediately what sort of system of value are we dealing with? Are we looking at, is this a, um, a monetary notion of value? Is this some sort of like humanistic notion of value? Is this an ethical notion of value? What, what do we mean when we say value? And obviously value is a, a term that in contemporary America is deeply loaded, whether that's um, uh, sort of bottom line market forces or neoconservative discourse about family values. I mean, that's, um, you know, Th those things, those things are not uh, accidentally invoked, um, and yeah. So to talk about aesthetic value of either a work of art or an experience um, quickly gets you into heady waters. I think that um, Annie, I like your your work so much because it seems to be driving precisely at that nexus. I mean, I, you know, um, institutional critique within art in the 20th century, starting from like I don't know Duchamp forward, but especially sort of 1960s forward. Um, has done a lot of work to draw attention to and map out the spaces or the institutional forms of power that determine what a thing, like what thing can be called art or not called art, right? So like in, in a vacuum, uh, Duchamp's uh, fountain urinal could be a work of art, but everyone knows that's not true. You need a museum, you need a, a gallery, you need a collector, like you need basically uh, someone else external or a lot of people external to say, yes, this is art, we will canonize it as art. Um, and I think that so much of art after all of this critique has kind of thrown up its hands in that, uh, against that, that point because it's really difficult then to figure out if you say, 
If that's the case about how an artwork operates, um, you either have to like tackle that problem or kind of like turn a blind eye to it. And most most people, I think, choose the second option because it's easier. And we also like the idea that when we walk into a museum or to a gallery space and we see a work of art, or if you walk into like a star architect building, you're like, this is beautiful. Like this is a you know pure aesthetic extension that just happens to also like take the form of materiality. But you also know there's an enormous amount of money behind it, and there's an enormous amount of like where there's money, there's politics. Um, and I think what's interesting about your work, Annie, is that it seems to go right at the heart of that. I mean, you, s you seem to, to hedge sometimes in, in conversation, you seem to be apologizing about, you know, my work is too close to um, the commodity. My work is too close to the, the forms of labor that I'm actually trying to critique. But I think that's actually what is precisely very interesting about it, mm -hmm. is that its, it's coziness there is one that is very apparent to the, the, the viewer. Like, you don't try to hide that. And also, then the viewer is confronted with the fact that yes, if I want this beautiful thing, I also have to take with it a system, and I'm confronted with a system that I purport to not like, whether it's a labor system or whatever. Yeah, it's so insightful of you, actually. I didn't say this, but like that piece at the MFA where I'm like electrocuting people to make thumbs up signs, <laughs> like literally, they're wearing gowns because it was for an event um, at the MFA for the platinum level donors. <laughs> yeah. And it was a black tie gala, and they were like, can you make some art to entertain <laughs> the highest donors? And then literally, it was like, oh man. And it's literally in a gallery called the like David Koch room or something, and it's all the oldest, most like expensive paintings of all time there. Um, <laughs> So yeah, actually, it's kind of interesting because like, at the same time, I'm like, oh god, I want to critique like, capitalism and art as a commodity, and yet I'm being hired by this museum to entertain the richest <laughs> patrons of art. Um, so that is always kind of like sitting within me as a duality. So, um, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you guys can probably talk for hours. Yeah. That's what I'm Don't worry, we'll, <laughs> we'll cut you off. Don't worry. I, well, I mean, actually, maybe there's a, a way to, to connect it here, too, in the sense that, um, I mean, the, the question, so when I talk to my students about architecture and labor, I mean, the, the question of money is what comes up immediately. And the, and the way architect, I teach in a program that has architecture students, but also building construction science students, so they're, they're going to be general contractors and inevitably they are going to make more money than most of the architecture students on average. And we, and we, we talk about this question, A, of understanding architectural work as labor itself, as understanding the kind of production of drawings as a labor that uh, deserves to be compensated fairly, that, that this is clearly a thing that uh, architects have probably you know, battled with for, for centuries, but um, I think it's a pretty interesting, the sociologist Magali Zafari Larson, uh, in her book called Profession, she says, I got interested in this problem because I was watching all these underpaid uh, architects laboring in these massive offices, and I would ask them, like, will you unionize? And they say, no, and, you know, that's beneath, that's, that's what, like, labor does. We're not labor, we're a profession. Mm -hmm. But she was interested in the fact that that reaction uh, was, was one coming from the kind of estimation of what we're doing as architects uh, that sits maybe in a different reality to the way we're compensated for what we do. So, so there's already that interesting question that of course goes back to a 19th century, late 19th century problem, the vision of the general contractor and the architect. Um, so we start there, but so the question of architecture's labor is, is one, but then you know, backing up a bit further to another problem that originates in the 19th century, what I've found <coughs> as a really good starting point is, I guess it was maybe three or four years ago when um, Zaha Hadid made the remark that, you know, it's not my responsibility what happens on the job site at the stadium in, uh, in Qatar. And people, you know, got up in arms about this, like how can you say that when migrant labor is being used and exploited in basically um, almost like wage slave kind of conditions and that there, there's a lot of you know, uh, injuries and potentially deaths happening around these labor conditions. And, and the interesting thing is, of course, what she was expressing is exactly what we've written into the contract, right? This is the AIA standard contract says we're not responsible for means and methods. So that this 
follows back to a 19th century sort of division of the architect and the labor of building architecture. That these are the, the idea, and you, you see lots of people in the early 19th century saying like, don't get your hands dirty. In fact, if the architect becomes labor, then there's more possibility for you to exploit your client. So the, this definition of the architect as a mediator between actual construction and money is, is this kind of fundamental 19th century uh, commitment for some of the early architects that, of course, that feeds into then understanding what you're doing as labor or not. So you position yourself between labor and, and capital and then what, what happens in that, that middle position. So, <coughs> so I, I think there's, and to end this like really long <laughs> set of comments is that I think it's interesting like in the South, in the American South in the 19th century that there's potentially a different set, I mean, there is a different set of conditions in the relationship of the labor of construction, the conceptualization of, of architecture, and that the labor itself is conceptualized as property in the same way the architecture is being conceptualized as property. So that what it winds up doing is creating a different kind of way of conceptualizing labor and then the eventual much later emergence of architecture as a, as a distinct practice in the South. So um, yeah. <laughs> That's where it ends. Um, I don't know, you, you brought up a question of sort of resistance or response to uh, political problems, and it's, it's interesting. My, my, my personal life, my personal work is aimed at resistance, right? So my scholarship, when I'm, I'm thinking with a, in a certain vein, will always be normative. And it'll always push against, um, it will always push against a certain kind of structure that is premised upon white normativity. Um, it'll always do that. But one of the ways that you can do that is not by yelling Black Lives Matter all the time, which is what I did for my entire graduate school, school career. That's how I was able to do work. One of the ways to do it is to, is to, in, is to disrupt people's sense, oh, I guess this is back to the panels, uh, disrupt people's sensibilities to the point where they're stuck. Right, and so this is like part of, part of the presentation for me has everything to do with I don't want us to land on whether or not the road should be a space of protest or a space of, uh, of, um, of, of police brutality. Because, it's, because if we do that in our sort of microcosmic spaces, it works out well, but the country itself has yet to do that kind of work. Um, and so I, I think part of what brings me here in terms of questions of infrastructure is that that is built into the very infrastructure of this country at, at sort of a historical kind of aesthetic level, right? So no shade to the president, but infrastructure week means what, right? I mean, it, there, there's a way in which this narrative of perpetual progress that the country, that is central to the country's mythical and cultural infrastructure is played out in the country's actual infrastructure, right? That, that these roads are not conduits of, of sheer travel. And, and, and what I wanted to do, you know, in, in articulating it this way is to say, until the country in general reckons with its past in the way that Germany might have done, why are we, we, we have to realize that these spaces will always be spaces of contestation. Do you, do you, see, what I'm, do you see what I'm getting at here? So, so I, I think that's one of the ways in which I was trying in my presentation to do that, and then I was hearing that in other spaces, and, and uh, William, I was um, resonating with you incredibly uh, at, at different levels, in large part because there are communities in this country who know that the country's lying to us, mm -hmm. and we yell that you're lying to us, and then you tell us we're the ones lying, lying to you, right? And then there's this, there's this situation, well, who's actually the fake news? Well, we know what the real is, but we, we'd rather tell ourselves that the real is not the real, right? So when Charlottesville happened, you know, Ellen tweets out, this is not us. And I'm looking, I'm saying, girl, where you been? You know, I mean, this is us, right? And let's wrestle with the fact that Charlottesville is us. And, and so I think, I think that's what I'm, until we do that kind of work, I'm interested in how this country will continue to sort of be stuck, how it will want to say something, how it will want to move forward. Uh, but it will continually shoot itself in the foot, such that progress is always a violent and violating process. Um, so I, so I, I, yeah, that's my roundabout way of thinking with both Brian and with, with William and with other folks on the panel too. I mean, it's, 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 it's in a different way 
to what Annie was talking about. So you, you do realize, like, I'm a professor at Syracuse University, right? And that that is wonderful and horrible at the same time, right? And I don't mean that in like a crapping on Syracuse, but like the university in many ways is a neoliberal institution hinging upon particular kind of economic realities. There are privileges associated with being here. And, and I'm you know, yelling that we have to resist while I make good money sitting in a, well, make money. <laughs> um, I won't say good, but, but make something like you know, you know, three digit salary or something. Um, something like that, right? But, I, but I'm secure and not even secure yet. Wait till tenure happens. Something like security, right? Uh, so, I, so that's essentially, you know, that, that impasse, that confusing space is also another space of impasse as well. And I feel you with that, Annie, that you, you, you get stuck there. You, know, you want to resist, you want to push back, and you realize, I got bills to pay. And then how do you live? You know, so. Yeah, so I think just to circle back, um, yeah, I think we push back on not understanding what is real by what is written in the dictionary or on our pay stubs or in a contract and um, maybe, yeah, Linda, how do you, how would you relate all of these sorts of comments that are un uncomfortable and complex to what we understand as the real? So I think what's um, really exciting for me with this group of people um, is kind of finding actually a shared conversation um, here. Uh, it, I think it feels, it feels like really kind of almost effortless and apparent um, here in this discussion and in, 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 in this, in the presentation, they're like, oh yeah, of course, like, like the real's not real and, and fic like everything that's real is a fictional construct, but then, you know, that's a shifting reality too. Um, but that, I don't think that's uh, how things usually are. So this is like a particular, um, a very particular group of people that I've been really happy um, to have been able to have a sustained conversation with and that we can have this conversation. Um, and I think what it's, it identifies is a sort of needed way of thinking through the moment that we're in right now. And we've had this conversation um, before about how, because um, what the beta real is essentially is that it's a sort of recognition of the need to produce structures to, what are categorical distinctions or fictions, the, the need for some sort of stable ground um, in order to start to understand reality. But, um, and that's just how we usually think of reality. But the, what the beta real is, is a recognition of that as such, um, where you can then, using that, put that stable ground, keep it, and let it be quicksand. And that is that moment of like sitting in the middle passage or in the contestation or in the kind of, um, it's not resolved, it cannot be resolved, and both are necessary. Um, and so I think for me what all of the work is sharing in, across all of the panels, in all of the pairings, um, is that kind of understanding um, of reality which sort of moves beyond, oh, like the hyper real or like, oh, the copy is authentic. Like, it's, it's not about those kinds of um, hyper realities anymore, and it's really about trying to understand the contradictions and ambivalence and these kind of really difficult tensions um, that are becoming more, especially in the political climate right now, more and more heightened and more and more pressing. Um, or maybe it always was. But. Yes, we have one more slide. Um, we're borrowing from Brian's article and um, the idea that difference is not overcome but maintained in and as generative and destructive tension. Um, and then, so that was uh, quoting from Linda, setting up the symposium, but to quote Brian and how he describes uh, Brooke Schultz's diagram um, about the impossibility of two absolutes. These two mark these two marks are made whole by the dotted and thus provisional path along which subjectivity orients toward its home. So um, I don't know how we're doing with time, but um, I guess opening up to talk about subjectivity and 
maybe seeing ourselves as this dotted provisional line trying to hash out all these ideas. <laughs> Just to add another layer to that, um, that quote that you quoted as me is actually me quoting Biko. Okay. So, and he didn't even realize he said it, so. <laughs> I'll just say something very short. Um, thanks for the advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the issue of log that I just finished editing, uh, there's 18 amazing contributions um, that are, the kind of fundamental idea was phenomenology ha is a kind of concept that as it's been used in architecture has gotten this, this name for a kind of universalizing agenda that it says this is the way the world is and should be experienced. And what the various writers uh, in this issue are doing, they're, they're, they're looking at conditions of gender or disability uh, or race as ways to understand that you know, there's not actually, the, the, there's not actually a single diagram that's gonna explain what architecture is meant to do. And it's in the effort of merely saying there's more than just this one thing that, that I think there's a, there's a lot of power in, in some of the essays that, are, that I was able to, to collect um, in the sense that that's the claim. There is <coughs> more. There's more than, than uh, a single diagram. Um, so, and what, I, what I, I'm excited about, it, at least at, in the sense of using phenomenology still, is the idea that subjectivity and the way people are in space matters to architecture, that that's what we have to be talking about, that the danger of um, <coughs> other, you know, of, of particular philosophical trends might be that we wind up kind of alleviating ourselves of the responsibility to think architecture in relationship to people, that we turn architecture itself into um, into, into something that, that doesn't have to have tensions because it functions in its own mm -hmm. uh, isolated discourse. And I, I, I mean, I think the, the attempt to always connect architecture to social and political experience makes it really difficult, like as we saw this morning, the question of how do you make stuff that's representing or talking about such a, talking about a moment of violence, but uh, even beyond that, just talking about humans. And it's trying to, so it's gonna make it harder, but that's probably what's good about caring about people is that it's a lot harder than not. It's the middle passage. I mean, I, 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 I think of it, so you all see this bottom one. I'm kind of influenced by it now, thanks Brian. <laughs> Um, it's this bottom image, right? And, and the bottom image, um, how many of you all are familiar with the Middle Passage? Raise your hand. Where the Middle Passage is? It's this moment where West Africans are placed in the bellies of slave ships, right? And then they, they end up going different places and they end up in the West. What's interesting though is for 23 hours out of the day, they're in a windowless dark space where they might as well be dead, but they're not. And where they might, where they are somewhere, but they're not anywhere because they don't know how far away they are from land, and they don't know how far away they have to get to land. And I'm interested. I, I, this is me riffing off of you. I'm interested in what that says in contemporary spaces. I'm not an architect. Don't even. I'm not gonna lie to y'all. Most of y'all know that. But but you know the reality is is my lack of architectural training just forces me to look at a space and say what's happening here. And I think in certain ways, like, we have to think along, you know, middle passage realities, not simply black middle passages, but also like the idea that, that we're, that at the human condition, I think, is a constant modality of disruption. It, it, it is always suspended between the ideals that we want to have and the complex, nasty ugliness that is everyday existence. And, and, and we so badly want certainty. We so badly want to say, we can get out of this. And then we try, and then you inevitably violate someone in the attempt to create certainty. So, so it's interesting for the Black Lives Matter movement, and I'll shut up after this, that the Black Lives Matter movement is founded by three queer black women. And DeRay McKesson 
is the guy who's the poster child for the movement. What happened to these three black queer women? They got lost behind this attempt to try to gain certainty about leadership in a resistance movement. Like, how do you, th how do you deal with the fact that every time you try to make certainty, somebody's gonna get brutalized in the process? And that's what I'm interested in. Not, so, not simply my own blackness as a way of thinking through the human condition, but also the fact that we lose things when we try to be certain. We really do to tell you about what nature could be or what culture could be. So that would just be one more piece on the table that like there may be a third, uh, a third diagram we need about the subject reaching out to tools in the way that the tool is already, um, the tool is already implying the subject, otherwise it can't be a tool. Hello, Ponte calls that wo wovenness, mm. right? Um, so I, I mean, that's literally all I have. I mean, the, the flesh is what just kept coming to mind as I was thinking about both what you and Annie were saying, you know, that that for, for him, the flesh is this primary thing that we're all participating in and somehow are, are sort of carved out of. But we are, we're only able to relate to each, each other because we're simultaneously the same and not the same thing at the same time. And so part of the prosthesis process is this, this conversation about reaching out into a world that is simultaneously you and not you. you know? And so I, I'm absolutely there with you. Uh, I just wanted to add that. Uh, and the scientific part made me think about Henrietta Lacks' cells, you know, how we've taken her cells and done some incredible things with them. And I don't know where to go with that, but I just thought about that as you were, you were talking. That, that idea that, in fact, your, your body already is a prosthetic uh, mm -hmm. It's something that you see a lot in Mirella Ponte too, right? He says these things like, these moments where I say like, I realized my body was older than myself. Mm -hmm. Like, it's an enormously disturbing sense when you realize like, my body is invested in something that seems to be older than my control of my own body. Um, and that, that it itself is something that's, that is not just me. It's also not me. My body is already, he says, my body is already sided with the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Although it might be the other way around, actually, right? Isn't it your cells replace every seven years? So maybe your self is actually older than your body. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> your cell is older than your cell. Your cell. So this, I was about to say yeah. the same thing, um, <clears throat> which I'm going to let Annie jump on, because we talked about this actually during the workshop that she gave here um, when we were talking about microbes. Um, I mean, it's interesting. I didn't know that your body replaces all its really cells every thing. seven years. Um, but <laughs> no, 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 no. Like, it's interesting <laughs> because this is totally on a tangent. But like, um, for instance, every time I have a breakup, <laughs> I want to shave my head because I can't stand the fact that I made this hair during that period of time. Mm -hmm. And certainly I have hair that's a lot longer <laughs> than, than seven years, but I was just thinking that. Um, but other, other than that. Did you shave um, your head the last breakup? Um, <laughs> that's not for right here. <laughs> 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 uh, but in terms of identity and maybe subjectivity and right. cells, actually, right. um, one of the things I'm really interested in, in the last two years is the microbiome. And maybe this is one of those kind of statistics that is wrong and being tossed around, but um, for every 10 cells you have, nine are some other organism, actually. And you can't tell because they're just really tiny and most of them live in your gut. But, um, and I'm sorry, because some of you already heard me like give this micro lecture, but um, they're doing really interesting experiments with it about the microbiome. For instance, they have these mice that they see section out in sterile environments, and they have no bacteria that's ever touched them. And then they get plated with the bacteria of an aggressive mouse, and it tends towards aggression. Same with anxiety and depression. And again, right, like this notion of the self is so fascinating because, um, up until now, I've always thought like nature versus nurture. I have the DNA for anxiety, or I grew up in a war-torn country and now I'm anxious. But like the idea that another organism with a different set of DNA co-makes me, um, I, I think again shifts that notion of identity and who we are, and also how we co-mingle. Because if we cohabitate, then our microbiome gets shared, and um, you know, very interesting things happen. So. Yeah, <laughs> cells, identity, multiplicity. Um, yeah. 
I mean, also, when you were mentioning the hammer, I thought of two quotes. One is, if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Um, and the other is a Marshall McLuhan quote, which is um, that we make our tools, and then our tools make us. And it's always this loop. Should we open the floor? Yeah, I'll, I'll just, um, rep before we open to Q&A, um, I'll just make a general comment. I think it's what's really fascinating for me is to see all of the resonances. Like, we're talking about the flesh and the ways in which things are kind of interconnected and commingled, but then we can also describe it in a super scientific way. We can also describe it in a super infrastructural way. Um, we can also describe it in the production of making. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's been really exciting for me um, to realize that this conversation um, is broader than um, just some things that I was thinking in my head and trying to understand my own reality. Um, and it's, um, I think the conversation has, has kind of um, pointed out, um, it's, it's encircled, I guess, a topic that I didn't really necessarily think yet was really a topic. Um, before we all got into conversation. Um, so I'm really grateful for the dialogue and all of the, um, you guys all inter entertained my many texts that I sent you and readings and questions and responses and, and furiously wrote back, um, back and forth. Um, so thank you so much. Questions from the audience? sitting in the chair and then Annie you were saying how um, often our body is aware of things before ourself is. Uh, is it possible that in the way that our body becomes aware of a certain truth that we haven't become aware of, do we use objects in a similar way to become aware of the truths of reality? Um, I don't know who that question is for. Maybe this is a general question. I actually have so I've been reading a lot about the non-conscious. So you know how we have the subconscious or the unconscious and conscious awareness. But there's also this non-conscious that uh, influences us. And basically, um, the reason why I've been looking into it is because there are theories that with computing, we haven't actually outsourced thinking. We've outsourced kind of these non-conscious processing, like information processing or like pattern making uh, processes. So how um, uh, our sensors or digital sensors turn uh, data into patterns that have some kind of meaning. So in a way, I, uh, I don't know if that maybe relates, but like this, the, the real is kind of all this unknown, this stuff we're not even aware of, like microbes living in our guts. So, um, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> See, this is what I mean that I think Linda and Irene um, curated such a nice panel because, yeah, I'm like totally obsessed with that. Um, yeah. <laughs> But in terms of your question, um, yeah, I mean, it's something I think about a lot. Um, there's certainly a lot more data floating all around us that would be overwhelming to perceive at any moment, right? Like all the time, constantly processing. And yet, in order for you to be alive, in a way, you do kind of, like, so there is a system running. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting because some technologists and some designers have been pushing that limit, like, uh, what's his name? David Eagleman did this thing where he created a haptic vest that um, vibrated in certain ways depending on the stock market behavior and he wanted to know, like not knowing exactly what all the vibrations meant, whether he could um, then become, get a kind of intuition 
for it, you know, like the way mothers get an intuition that their baby is hungry now or crying now, and but they couldn't tell you like, if this, then that, that kind of like really big data processing that our brain already does um, is interesting to me. And yeah, like I think there are certain design moves that can illuminate that or not. Um, but I wouldn't be able to tell you so directly, I guess, like, these are the moves you should make. Um, but I think your question is an insightful one. I mean, I would just point out to be careful with that, right? So the example from this week of Cambridge Analytica, have you guys been following the story? Uh, yeah. Do you know like how this works? So this is the company that harvested a bunch of data from Facebook <coughs> and particular likes in 2014 um, and used these likes from about 50 million users to determine essentially political um, motivations. And the way that it works is if they had 68 likes, so basically 68 different times where you liked something, they could predict within a 95% chance um, things about you. Were you black? Were you white? Were you gay? Were you straight? How would you vote? If they had 160 likes, they could predict better than your parents. And if they had 300 likes, they could p pick, or they could predict better or more accurately than your significant other. So within 300 likes, Cambridge Analytica knew you better than the person that you're sleeping with, which is insane. And the creepier part, okay, obviously this is now in the news and people are talking about this and Facebook is changing all its policies, but the problem is those metrics don't change for you. For most people, that will then last for like a long, long time, perhaps their entire life. So that even if they only harvested likes from you when you were like 17 or 25, when you're 65, that information has the same potency, right? So in that case, I would say there we have an, in an instance of a tool in a certain way, reading things that are perhaps non-conscious, I don't know, but the, the mm -hmm. effects are insanely uh, powerful and deeply lasting and for all intents and purposes, a kind of permanent. So I, I would also say, watch out, like, be really careful and think about how this, wor how this stuff works. Yeah, that one is something really interesting because I've also been following it closely. In a way, um, the problem, I should check myself when I say this, but I feel like part of the problematic aspect is how Cambridge Analytica used the data afterwards and not the findings per se, like the findings unveil, unveil uncomfortable truths about ourselves to ourselves. Like, gosh, like maybe I didn't know that I'm secretly conservative, <laughs> but like, you know, all the data points that way. Um, that's different than I think using this for a certain kind of political manipulation. Um, it gets really, I think, troubling for me, not to trouble you all so much, but like that same kind of data we collect for genetics too, you know, like there are artists that actually do really beautiful work about this, like Heather Dewey Harburg did this piece where she would literally just take like a cigarette butt off of a subway car and then she would sequence it and she would 3D print the face of that person. <laughs> and you know, it's all about illuminating di um, not just digital surveillance, but genetic surveillance, but also I'm sorry, I don't mean to go on so many tangents, but like, um, it makes assumptions too, right? Like not every code of DNA will then definitively say that you are exactly like this, so it also illuminates certain prejudices in science. Um, like when you see this snip that indicates that you're Southeast Asian, how are you gonna render that? That those are still subjective choices. Um, I don't know where we were going with this, but. Uh, <laughs> Can I, can I take a, a stab at this to a certain extent too? I, I think what I'm, I'm interested in is the production of truth is also a question, as we've been talking about, is also a question of home. And, and, and so, mm. France Fanon has this, this line in black skin, white mass, where he's speaking of cigarettes, where I used to smoke. Uh, but but, but uh, I've been sober how many weeks? I don't know, Sean. You probably. Three, four? We're at three. Three. Four. Four. We'll, we'll round up to four. We'll round up to four. Um, <laughs> No, but he has this line in Black Skin, White Mask where he says, you know, I'm not at home in the world. So, you know, even something as habitual as smoking a cigarette, like I need a nicotine, you know, hi. And he says, I'm always acutely aware of every move that I have to make to smoke the cigarette, right? So he says, I know I have to reach into my back drawer and pull one out and I know I have to light a match. Whereas many people aren't thinking that he says, I, I don't do this out of unconscious habit, but out of implicit knowledge. Um, and so there's a way in which the question for me about tools, even tools like Cambridge Analytica, um, the facility with which we use tools speaks to our facility with our environments, right? It speaks to how home we are, how at home we are in the world. Um, and so that, 
even the uses of tools become sites of contestation because if I'm not at home in the world, I might take a soccer ball and shoot it through a basketball hoop, right? And there's a particular way in which like that uses of the soccer ball in that way speaks to my unheimlichkeit, right? My, my lack of home homeliness. Um, and so even the, the use of a tool, ultimately what I'm trying to get at here is even the use of a tool and even the invocation of a hammer and like Martin Heidegger is an invocation of a kind of home, homeness, at homeness, with everyone knowing what a hammer is and what a hammer is supposed to do. Um, and, and so that becomes, even for me, a site where we have to raise some further questions. As, as an aside, Heidegger was trained in theology too, and so the ha he, it's not by actually use the hammer because Jesus was a carpenter. And so he, he's trying to also signal um, to Christianity. So there's this normative Christian significance beneath these supposedly like neutral analyses that are also contesting or speaking to a contested truth. Because not everybody's Christian and not everybody needs to use a hammer even knows the hammer significance. So is that helpful? I mean, like it depends on how at home you are in the world, if, if the tool actually can be the production or the object or the avenue to truth. Um, and and it, it's just, I mean, for, for me, I can walk down an alleyway at nighttime not having problems, right? But you walk down an alleyway at, at nighttime and all of a sudden somebody might can't call you, right? There's a particular way in which that, that it's a, even the use of the alleyway becomes a contested, contested site because you might be less at home than I am. Do you understand what I'm? Chairs, chairs seem universal until you go somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, they seem <laughs> right. They seem universal until they're not, right? So that's the interesting part. Yeah. Um, like scientists are using to like kind of like play God in a sense of reformulating um, like DNA and genetics so like they can decide like I don't know height like mm -hmm. athletic ability and stuff so like what happens when you become afraid of the tools that you're using I was about to say something and I wanted to run through many scenarios to see if it was true. Um, so maybe it's not always true, but I was gonna say that most tools are fairly neutral. It just depends on how you use them, right? Like CRISPR also can, um, you know, like potentially help someone with Parkinson's not have Parkinson's anymore. Yes, and it can also unfortunately make it so that you can design your baby in particular ways that reflect your cultural hierarchies. So this is a tough one. Um, I guess I would kind of shift that conversation in that oftentimes the people who have power to make these decisions, like this isn't a very democratic um, conversation often, right? Like because first you need to know what CRISPR is and then you have to like read all these papers. Often it's a really small ivory tower group of people who are kind of discussing it and then of course, I guess, I suppose there are lawmakers also. But um, this is, I think, re I really believe this, like why art and design really come into play because when Heather makes those um, sculptures of the you know, DNA surveillance, then everyone can talk about it a little bit, right? Like I, I wanna make it so that a 14 year old girl on YouTube and also like um, us sitting here in the symposium can have these conversations because they affect all of us. Um, so I guess going back to your point, I'm not sure that all tools are inherently loaded in those kinds of ways. Um, but I'm sure you could probably find some examples where they are. Um, yeah. One, one thing that, is this on? Yeah, all right, one, get it really close. Um, 
one thing I would tag on, this is like these moments where I'd say, I'm never gonna talk about Heidegger again, <laughs> and then, <laughs> then he comes up again, mm -hmm. and then I, for some reason, it's useful, and mm -hmm. I don't know if that's good or bad, but there's a distinction that he makes in being in time but from between fear and anxiety, and that fear occurs when there's a thing. There is something that's proximate enough for me to fear that it could do actual damage, and anxiety is the experience of, of no thing. That's anxiety, in Heidegger's definition, anxiety occurs because you can't actually identify a thing that is producing that experience, and I mean, I guess fear is probably the right way to initially describe some specific piece of technology. Maybe there's fear of like, if I see a handgun on a table, I could have proximate fear of that. But the anxiety distinction is an interesting one for the, when we say technology in a kind of vaguer way, like, you know, should we have anxiety over technology? And things start to leave their kind of immediateness. And I, I kind of wonder when we, talk about CRISPR or something like that, are we, f is it an immediate fear or are we just anxious about not knowing what things are gonna mean anymore when this is there? And we're not even scared of it, we're, s we're just having anxiety about mm -hmm. uh, nothing. I don't know, we're having anxiety. Yeah, uh, so I don't know if that's actually helpful. And maybe it's not so much a fear of the actual tool, it's more a fear of being left behind by not having access to the tool, because in a way it's like, you don't have to use the tool if you don't want to. But I think it's actually more linked to what if you become inadequate because you're not enhanced or like, because you don't have access. I'm, I'm just going to add really briefly, the production of fear or <laughs> and its sort of dissipation into anxiety, I think comes from a series of unreconciled strivings. There, in, in certain ways, technology, as we think about it in a sort of banal sense, like an everyday sort of basic sense, is premised upon perpetual futurity, which means we never look back. So we look forward at CRISPR and we're freaked out about CRISPR, we forget about the atom bomb, right? We've been here before. <laughs> and, but but we're, we, our anxiety is produced because we forgot we've been here before, so then we produce something that has potentially dangerous effects excuse me, particularly dangerous effects. And so then we freak out, like, oh, we did it, you know, right? Like, like we're about to do some dangerous stuff, but we don't realize that we've already done this. And, and part of it is, and this is a specifically, or at least from my perspective, a uniquely American phenomenon, that, that black, white, or whatever, we are perpetually oriented in, toward futurity um, when, it, when maybe we should probably look back every once in a while and, and not look back in a sense of trying to give one specific narrative but just sitting in the past in, in its multiplicity. Um, not in history, but in the past, which is a distinction. History tells a story, the past just kind of is this hodgepodge of stuff, and we haven't done that, right? So Donald Trump is Ronald Reagan number two, but worse, right? I mean, it, it is what it is, like Bill Clinton is Carter. I mean, there's ways in which, like, we've been here before, but we don't look back, and technology offers us the opportunity to be scared but it also, if, if unchecked, if we don't think with the past, it, it, we can continue to reproduce some of the many things that we're scared of now, or we have been scared of in the past. Everybody went down for that a -bomb project, you know, but, but everybody was like, let's do it, or the government was. So. There we go. Okay. Um, I guess the, my question kind of ties back to what we're talking about right now, and um, also more directed towards Annie's work. Um, so uh, you showed us the experiment where, um, with the cards, where um, the person would start sweating, um, and once they found out their realization, their um, attitude would change. Mm. Uh, I guess this is more, it's open to any answer. I don't really have a specific answer that I'm looking for, but um, <coughs> what do you guys think about all of these new technologies and the awareness of surveillance and the realization of perhaps um, that you're sweating or uh, this change of vision with someone else, um, how does that alter our reality? Does that enhance and give us a more broad vision of it or does that neglect a reality, individual reality? I don't know if that makes sense. 
Um, it's a good question. It's like really broad in some ways too. Um, I guess one of the first things that popped to my mind is that a lot of times these technologies reveal inherent biases within ourselves. Like for instance, uh, with surveillance and uh, facial recognition software, right? Like immediately, I think it was discovered that computer vision is kind of racist. Like it can't see some black faces, it can't see some Asian faces where the eye proportions are not the correct one because often our machine learning data sets are just literally like data sets of white faces. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting because First we become aware of the surveillance and then we discuss that, but then we, e even within the surveillance, we discover the kind of racial biases we have, right? Like, in, I guess then you could talk about access and things like that. Um, surveillance is a difficult one because, for instance, I had my DNA sequenced, uh, or like I gave up a sum of my DNA to 23andMe because I was curious about myself and also I wanted to know if I had certain like diseases um, and then also I contributed this data so that they could increase their data bank for research. So it's like this kind of exchange, right? Like you give things up to Facebook and then they give something back to you and we are kind of in a dance together. Most people I think realize this now, right? Like when you buy a membership at WeWork, they track where you sit and for how long but then you know you get like a swanky place to have your meet your investor meetings, so I don't know. I think that we are more aware of it than ever, um, and part of that is again for me what kind of designs add interesting things to that conversation, like how how do we increase the awareness and then also almost like playfully turn it on its head. Or hmm, trying to think of an artist, because occasionally people um, use that surveillance or those technologies to benefit them, and I can't remember, but like, it'll come to me, and I'll share it with you. I mean, we kind of been talking about this better realities and how we sort of grapple with what it is and what it is not and how we um, we celebrate uncertainty in a way. And um, it's also been discussed that how we as architects sort of have to um, introduce, not, well not introduce, but rethink the role of the, like the social and political aspect of it. So it's not just a discourse <coughs> of itself, but also everything that happens around it. I was kind of thinking of, let's say, well, yeah, right now we're fruitfully having this discussion here in this particular um, group, but then let's say, how do you apply this as an architect, let's say, to um, a different group of people in the third world countries, mm -hmm. where how do you live with this uncertainty? Like, can you afford being uncertain in those kind of circumstances, or do you have to sort of say, okay, well, yes, I do understand that I leave out some things, but those decisions have to be made. Like, how do you sort of manage in those kind of situations, not sitting in the auditorium in Syracuse University? I, I, the reason I, I, I don't want to answer this, so it's going to come off as if I'm pushing back against you, and that's not quite what it is. Uh, no, it, it, what. It, Communities who are disadvantaged, I won't collapse all of us into one, right? I'm not, that's not my point, right? But, but, what, I, but I will, what I will suggest is in certain ways, after, after World War II happens, there's a collapse of a meta-narrative, which means that from, for, for the world itself, it's constantly living in a state of uncertain anxiety. Um, it means what, what that ultimately entails, right, is exactly what you're suggesting. And I've had conversations with many of my, my friends and family members about this too. Like I used to be on the streets protesting for Sandra Bland and we would say, we will win. And I'm sitting here saying, with, saying this with these folks with as much conviction as possible knowing that I'm lying to myself, right? Because, I, because the reality is, is that, I won't say the reality, what we've seen in the past is that even the desire for, for certainty for, from communities who need certainty, who certainty could do some really great work, 
it's either going to be denied because the, the world, the, the larger context itself is in, is in crisis, or that certainty will reproduce a series of violences that will produce other uncertainties. So if, if for example, think of, if we think about the civil rights movement, um, the 50s and the 60s, King was out here preaching these sermons, but it was Ella Baker who was the one who was organizing, right? So, so yeah, there was progress made. And certainty happened in 64 and 65, and black women were still looking at black men like, yo, y'all are, prob are a problem, right? Because we just forgot about it. Hey, we got the lunch counter, right? And black women are looking at us like, bro, you know? And, and, and so there's a way in which, like, even I, I, I sympathize and want so badly to have certainty. I'm not saying the desire for certainty is bad. I'm saying the production of it will inevitably, or at least this is my perspective on this, will inevitably produce either the production of certainty will produce some kind of residue, some kind of loss, some kind of violence that we won't be able to fully, you know, sort of deal with, I, I think. And that's probably the best way that I can articulate it. So, yeah. so are, you, are you kind of suggesting that certainty is the goal and uncertainty is the disadvantage? No, I'm not suggesting. I'm just trying to mm -hmm. say that mm -hmm. um, in this group of people, we are discussing it, and most of us agree on how it's in the long run, or right now, it's more it makes more sense to be constantly on the edge of two things. Yeah. But like, there comes those moments, and as, as I said, especially in like um, different communities where you feel like this elitist jumbo mumbo doesn't like it doesn't go. You have to people right. are kind of expecting something from you. And you feel like, I mean, like even if you do believe in that, it's kind of really hard to reiterate it into something that would make sense to them. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not mm -hmm. saying like I am for certainty or I'm against something. And just like I'm trying to think of how can you reiterate it in a more populist way. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, the reason why I asked is because I mean, uncertainty for me opens up the question of resilience and kind of adaptability, which I actually think is kind of an advantage to be at. And certainty is one of those topics that to me don't really exist. Like there's not, so there's this thought experiment that I really like um, by a French philosopher called Quentin Mayasu. And he, um, wrote this very short uh, book called Extra Science Fiction. And uh, he kind of imagines worlds where, like for example, accidents are the norm. So, you know, we have come to believe in this scientific uh, reproducibility of certain situations and experiments. And if you can reproduce a situation scientifically, it means it's real. Um, and these, uh, oh, we all know that's part of a, like a historical narrative which used to not, well, used to be different. And uh, so he imagines what if suddenly accidents uh, actually um, become more prevalent than the reproducible situations or the kind of expected um, responses or like, you know, kind of disrupting causality. And in a way, you would also adapt to that. You would just, it would just be a different way of perceiving um, reality. Can, can I, so I, I, I feel you. The, the thing about it is I know exactly, like I won't say I know exactly what you're saying because I'm not you, but, but I, feel, I, I feel that <coughs> affective impulse. And, and, and yes, we try. The, the, the thing mm -hmm. is, and, and you do try to produce certainty. I do say, you know, whether or not we will win. Palestinians in this regard, and I, I shouldn't go too political, but we're here now, right? Like, there is an uncertainty at the Israeli-Palestine border. There is an uncertainty in Chile. There is an uncertainty in these places where insurgencies are happening. And those folks who are on the underside of these things need certainty in order to continue going. There needs to be the promise of the possibility of progress in order for these folks to be inspired. I absolutely understand that sentiment, which is why I say we will win. But when we win, what happens? That's the question, right? That's, what I, that's, why, that's why I'm like, you're right, and we're sitting here in the comfort and luxury of this speculative space where we can ask those questions, right? 
uh, but but I but I've not I've, I've looked at the course at least of American history, and we win a lot, and a lot of folks die behind that winning, and so I'm interested. I'm not talking specifically about like white America here. When the Black Civil Rights Movement moved up, Black women were left behind, right? And so there's a way in which, with the Black Lives Matter movement, Black queer folk have been left behind. So winning is happening. Certainty is being produced. And in the wake of that certainty, in the wake of those wins, we immediately discard those things that could not fit within that framework of winning. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not pushing against you, I want certainty is bad as so many other communities do, and I think you're right. I think that that impulse is necessary. And, and what I'm cautioning is that try your best to do that knowing that this is experimentation. King didn't know he was shading out black women when he did it. He just did it because he thought this was the best move to make till he realized the US legal process couldn't handle black women because they're, they're too woman to be male and they're too black to be white. Right, and so, how, and so he didn't know he was doing that, so he didn't realize that. So my, my point is not, let's just completely throw out certainty at a practical level. In your design, you try, and realize that in the wake of that trying, somebody's gonna be lost. But I think um, one aspect of your question that still hasn't been addressed is, because um, I don't think you're pushing back against that. I think you're asking, how do, you, how do we explain that? How do we make that, how do we as designers mm. make, communicate that across to other people in a way that is understandable, that people can begin to recognize. Um, if you tell mm -hmm. a counter narrative mm -hmm. um, to the main UNESCO World Heritage mm -hmm. story, when you produce that counter narrative, what we're all agreeing on is that in the production of a counter narrative, there is another narrative that is marginalized. Like how do you, how do you get that across um, to people to understand it? Um, and I actually think Annie's work is a really great mm. example of being able to do that. Um, Annie is constantly taking things that should be certain science, right, that's a fact, um, and she's flipping it on its head, and, and she does it in a way where she has a TED talk about smelfies, you know, like, <laughs> it's, it's just, um, it's in a way that is, there, there are ways as, as designers that you can operate um, both at an intellectual, academic, institutional um, uh, level, that's really the wrong word, um, but also in a way that is somehow to do with the making of the thing itself and the design and the object um, and the experience of it that is um, intuitive enough uh, that it can be communicated to the 14-year-old girl on YouTube mm. that's watching her. Mm. Um, yeah, I think a to challenge too, like I guess, I'm not, I'm not sure if I have examples of where certainty or certitude is a productive force. Like I think about what are certain things, dictatorships are certain, um, certain types of like religious thinking can be very certain. Um, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism, so certain types of economics can be very mm -hmm. certain. And almost all of those, uh, certainty produces uh, exclusion, it produces, um, it, it basically flattens. And I think, I mean, I appreciate your, your question about like, what's the, where's the chaos politic in this? Like when, you, when the rubber hits the road and the facts on the ground are things that where you have to make decisions and like you can't sit up here and like talk pie in the sky nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I would push back and say, well, first of all, show me, show me real certainty, show me real certitude because I haven't seen it yet. And then secondly, I would say your job as a smart person who has been to the whatever, whatever this room is um, and has been challenged with these ideas about beta reels and who, has some notion about the instability or the disruptability of, of a given narrative. Your job then, when you leave, is precisely to make that understandable to the person who would otherwise be sucked into the populist movement without ever asking a second question, or the person who is like operating under the yoke of certainty. I mean, again, you think about like, why, as, why does the American political system laugh at Russia? Because the election of Putin was certain. Like, it's not an election because it was certain. We knew it was going to happen. So I, 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 would, I would turn it back around and say, I think you're, you're totally nailing your assignment. Like it's our assignment too, but it's also your assignment because, I mean, if you wanna accept that there is a, a mode that you can operate in where everything is certain and all, all hammers hit all nails all the time, mm -hmm. go for it. You just won't find me on your team. And number two, I think that would be uh, a misuse of what this space, this school um, is doing and what this school has, has shown you, but that's just me.
I guess it just, I guess Linda was the only one who actually understood yeah. the question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. uh, it was. I got it as soon as she started talking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it wasn't about me, sort of. Because I, I do share most of the things that goes on here. But it's just the question is how do you True reiterate player. it to speak to bigger masses that sometimes need an answer? It's know? a perpetual negotiation so. process, essentially. I mean, at a very basic level, I think Linda articulated it correctly that part of what Annie's doing is, is doing that. But the other part of it is that you're, as someone who is at the, who does come from the mountaintop, your job is to consistently remind people that there are other people we're wiping out in the process of our, of our progress, mm -hmm. right? So, so I don't know how you design there are other people who are white, and, you know, but I, but I will say that one of the things that I've done, if this helps at all, I've never designed a building in my life, so I don't know how this works, but what we consistently do, I do it in my classes, I do it when I'm actually able to hit the streets, is we're out here saying Black Lives Matter, but what about Islan Nettles, who was a transgender woman who was beaten to death in New York six, seven years ago, right? We can yell all we want, but reminding folks that there's a cost to that, you got to do it in a really basic way, but you, you have to, the, the goal is to consistently negotiate and remind folks mm -hmm. that your very, your very certitude about the strength of your project might be leaving somebody in, in, in the wake. Does that, does that help? Yeah. I, I got it as soon as she starts. I said, Linda, she's right. Yeah, we didn't answer this question at all. We over here hype about uncertainty. <laughs> Sorry I, about that, man. And I guess um, looping back to Linda, I, I think that a lot of things that she teaches you in studio also help, like um, affect and narrative, right? Like I think that, for instance, in Hollywood, sometimes <laughs> when people make really beautiful films, it can it always blows my mind when something. Um, appeals to a lot of people, but also has very nuanced points. Um, I think a lot of science fiction does that. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, when you talk about the populace specifically, right? Like, yeah, like bring your heavy philosophy with a heavy side of sexiness, entertainment, mm -hmm. you know, humor, um, just drop dead gorgeous aesthetics, but you can also say really hard things at the same time. Yeah. So I'm just watching the time, and so we passed I don't know how strictly we have to watch it, so maybe we'll take a last question if there is one. All right. Okay. Um, so it's for the. Maybe this is like a. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> um, okay, maybe this is. Oh, it doesn't. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I totally. Oh, okay. So. Maybe this is a question that we don't want to end on because perhaps it's morbid, but also just out of curiosity. Uh, what happens to subjectivity and objectivity in the post-Anthropocene era? Mm. Because it's this whole reality based around ourselves now, um, but, and for some reason that's just my head or something. But like what happens if uh, we're actually living in the reality of like, the tiger, per se? And it doesn't understand that there's a subjective or the objective, but maybe it even understands like a third thing that we have no nomenclature for. So I just am curious what happens at that point in history or even in the present day. Can I say something? And if I understand correctly, I think we've always been in that space. Like it's just, mm -hmm. Anthropocene. It's just our perception that we haven't been. So we're really there right now. <laughs> That's incredibly <laughs> sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, I. I, I yeah, I, she hit the nail. Yeah. <laughs> she hit the nail. I mean, it, 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 I mean, it, it is, and what well, part of it is too is is I don't know. People get frustrated that people make things political all the time, but they happen to be that way. And the production of a subject is, is, is essentially the mind, it, it's, it's a mind product, it's a mind child of a group of very specific people, right? It is not the mind child of poor working class Irish folks. It is not the mind child of, of, of women. It is a mind child of elite French and German thinkers, particularly males who think of subjectivity as a centerpiece of the entire, and we live in the wake of that legacy, right? And so, you know, Descartes and Kant and Hegel, all these folks are incredibly interesting and incredibly influential up through, up to and through Heidegger, right? But the problem is, is that, you know, there are groups of folks across the world 
whether they're women, whether they're poor folks, whether they're people from the East, whether they're people in Africa, whether they're people in, in you know, in, in developing countries who, who live as non, who live as something other than, as Wahelie says, not quite human. And understand what it means to be not quite human and are okay <laughs> with being not quite human. Um, because there's a beautiful joy. I mean, not quite human produced hip hop, right? You know, so there's something about living in this age that is as hopeful as it is morbid. And I guess I could offer some of my favorite female philosophers who kind of um, hit on this, like Jane Bennett yeah. with Vibrant Matter or yes. Donna Haraway. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to call it like object-oriented ontology, but like other kinds of ontologies, right? So mm -hmm. maybe those would be good launching points. No, it was just one more point of reference. Um, uh, an article called The Four, Four Theses on the Climate of History by Deepesh Chakravarti, mm -hmm. where he basically makes the suggestion that if we, like, we had this 18th, 19th century narrative that tried to formulate subjectivity, but it turns out that that was white male European subjectivity or just white male subjectivity. And then we had this whole subaltern and post-colonial project that is trying to say, no, look, there are lots of different forms of the way people exist, and you can't, you can't hold them all together under one sign. He says, okay, we got there, but now the step, the Anthropocene step is that, well, we all might die, though, that we might all collectively die together when we, when we crank things up past the, the two degree mark, that there's a point of no return. And his suggestion is like, Okay, so, so the one thing that the Anthropocene might can do for us is conceptualize a way that we are all collectively together in something, but that is that collectivity is entirely negative. Like, we're all together because we might kill ourselves. And that, let's talk about morbid ways to end. Right. Like, there's something, <laughs> but, but maybe that's a reference point to, to look at. He's, there's a couple of Chakrabarty articles that are connected to that. So on that morbid <laughs> note, um, that will be our, our ending note. Um, thank you all so much uh, for being here. And, uh,